Hello all. If you are new to this channel, welcome. And if you are returning after a long day of turmoil, welcome back. I hope this video satiates your appetite for a decent amount of sleep. Stay safe, show love, and keep calm. Now, on to the video. Everybody watched her dance. Guys and girls alike just couldn't seem to break away from that hypnotic sway. The girl had just walked into the bar, gone straight to the middle of the room and started dancing. Just like that, we were all under her spell. Had I known then what I know now, I would have turned and run as far and as fast as I could. I would have tried to, anyway. It was hard to describe, but just one look at that girl was enough to ensnare you. She was perfect. Waist-length red hair, milky skin, and eyes that burned into your soul. The first guy plucked up the courage to try his luck. He was without doubt the best-looking man in the room. He knew it, too. He walked over to her and opened his mouth to say something, but she put a finger to his lips before any words could escape them, smiled, and shook her head. Something about the way she turned him down hit me like a mace to the stomach. It was without doubt the most brutal thing I'd seen. She didn't insult him, didn't laugh at his face or throw a drink over him. She let him know, without saying a word, that she would never dine to let him so much as speak to her. Other men and women approached over the course of the evening. Every one of them rejected. They were lucky. I never thought I'd stand a chance. After seeing the people she'd already turned away, what hope did a chubby, short, 19-year-old geek have? Better to preserve what dignity I had and sip my drink alone. When she pointed at me and beckoned for me to join her, I felt as though I were in a dream. I have to admit that, despite being sat in the corner of the room, I actually looked behind me to see if she was looking at somebody else. No. She wanted me. I froze. There wasn't enough alcohol in the world to give me the courage to dance with her. She laughed and danced her way over to me. A moment later, she took my head in her hands and kissed me full on the lips. That kiss... It was like nothing I'd ever experienced. Better than sex, it sent hellfire coursing through my brain to set every nerve ending ablaze. Every forbidden, perverted thought I'd ever had came rushing through my consciousness. I felt proud to be an animal, a creature whose instincts compelled it to lust and violence. Nothing was beyond me. I could do whatever I wanted to whoever I wanted. And then it was over. Humanity came flooding back. The reality of social norms, ethics, and morality reasserted themselves, and I remembered who I was. I was a chubby, short, 19-year-old geek who had no business thinking and feeling the way I had. That wasn't who I was. You bet it was who I wanted to be, though. Deep down, in that place where sense gives way to desire, that was what I wanted. I think she could sense that. I think that's why she picked me. It's a rush, isn't it? She said. Getting a taste of the beast within is always a rush. I stammered something incomprehensible. My head was still reeling from the kiss. She smiled, and I, like a rat, staring into the eyes of a viper. Give me your number. I... sure. I managed... Do you want me to text you? Uh, do you have your phone with you? I, I could write it down if you prefer. Uh, do you have a pen? She held up a hand before I could continue rambling. Just tell me your phone number. I have an excellent memory. I did as I was told. I'll see you again. And with that, she left. I spent the next three days in agony. I couldn't get that kiss out of my mind. 
the way I'd felt left me ashamed and aroused in equal measure. I spent every waking moment replaying the scenario in my head, trying to get another taste of how it had awakened some primal creature within me. Every night, I dreamt of that girl. She had my number, but hadn't given me hers. Looking back on it, it's amazing just how much power that gives you over a person. But would she call back? But would I ever see her again? Was it all just a cruel prank? When she finally did call, my phone didn't display her number. I recognized her voice instantly, though. Her words like poison dripping into honey. Meet me at the bank in an hour. I didn't even have time to ask which bank she meant. The powerlessness of my situation began to dawn on me. I couldn't just refuse to go. I might never have the chance for another kiss. She had me well and truly dangling on her hook. In the end, I set off for the closest bank to my house. Sure enough, she appeared exactly one hour after she had hung up the phone. I realize how this sounds now that I'm writing it down. I'm sure some of you are thinking, Fuck that, I'd run. That's exactly what I should have done. I couldn't do it, though. All it took was one kiss to make me an addict. Uh, hi, I said as I approached. I've been thinking about you a lot. I, I wonder if uh, maybe you want to get a coffee or something. I don't drink coffee. Oh, uh, okay, maybe a bite to eat. No thanks. How much do you have in your savings? I blinked. Uh, not much. A couple hundred dollars. Perfect. You can make an ATM withdrawal. Not as many questions that way. You want my savings? I said it half as a question, half as a statement. I couldn't quite believe what I was hearing. That depends. Do you want another kiss? I shook my head. Enough was enough. This was some kind of scam and I wasn't going to be a victim anymore. All I had to do was turn around and walk away. I didn't need another kiss. As soon as the thought entered my head, my body rebelled. My skin itched and my palms started to sweat. I gritted my teeth against a sudden rush of pain in my stomach. That money wasn't everything. Another kiss was worth it. I withdrew the cash. Good dog, she said. She leaned in and kissed me. It wasn't as good as the first time. The first time, I had never experienced anything so intensely pleasurable. Even so, the feeling of power and fertility I'd been trying in vain to remember flooded me once more. All those dark little thoughts and urges resurfaced, and I knew there was nothing bad or wrong about them. Humans are animals. Animals fight and fuck. Animals rape and kill. The sensation receded, leaving me feeling confused, guilty, and turned on. I opened my eyes, and she was gone. You know you can tell me anything, don't you? My mom said. Since dad passed away, mom had been trying to be extra motherly to me and my sister. Fully cooked breakfasts, family board game nights, the works... She looked at me with deep and genuine concern. I, I'm fine, I lied. Just flu or something. It had been three weeks since my last kiss. Nothing else mattered. Not food, not sleep, not even family. My whole body ached with the need for another kiss. My skin crawled as though insects were burrowing beneath it. Every time I drifted into unconsciousness, my dreams were full of monsters and suffering. I rolled over in bed. I didn't want to look at my mom. I couldn't face her. I love you, Jason. I didn't reply. My bedroom door shut and my mom's footsteps faded away. I heard a faint sob. I screwed my eyes shut and tried not to think about my last kiss. It was impossible. I may as well have tried not to breathe. It's drugs, isn't it? My sister said. I hadn't heard her come in. I, no, Alex, it's not drugs. Bullshit. I sighed, rolled over and looked her straight in the eye. It's not drugs. 
Right, okay then. Let's pretend I believe you. If it's not drugs, what is it? It sure as hell isn't flu. A girl. I sighed. A girl. Jason, you're a mess. You don't eat, you don't talk, you just sit in your room and lie on your bed. I get that love can be rough, but come on. I don't love her. What? I said I don't love her. I fucking hate the bitch, okay? Alex took a step back. I hadn't realized I'd been shouting. I sighed. It felt good to tell the truth, even if it was only a partial truth. I did hate the girl who kissed me. I hated her for what she'd done to me. I hated her for not calling me for three torturous weeks. I hated her because I so badly wanted another kiss. What's her name? Whatever she did to you, I'll knock her out for it. I... I don't know her name. My phone buzzed. I answered straight away. Meet me at my house. I'll text you the address. That was her, wasn't it? Alex said. No. Don't lie to me. Where are you going? Out. I pushed my way past her. She grabbed me by the shoulder. I spun around, almost ready to hit her until I saw the dampness in her eyes. Please don't go to her. I took her hand off my shoulder. I wanted to hug her, to apologize to her, but I was too ashamed. With my head down and tears running down my face, I left. The girl's house was on the outskirts of town, where the city started to give way to the countryside. To call the building a house would be like calling the works of Salvador Dali doodles. The thing was a mansion, secured behind enormous walls topped with vicious barbed iron railings. As soon as I approached, the gate opened for me, allowing me into a driveway the size of a small street. As I walked towards the front door, I took a moment to look at the garden. I didn't recognize most of the flowers, but I knew foxgloves and nightshades when I saw them. Beautiful and deadly flowers. Here and there, the garden was studded with marble sculptures. Each one depicted a naked person in agony. There were men impaled on spikes or being sat on by slavering wolves. Women wept as their bodies were engulfed in sculpted flame. She stepped out of the front door, her face split by a cruel sneer. I want you to give me a present, she said in a sing-song voice. Her hands were held behind her back. What do you want? I asked. I'd intended it to come out as a hiss. I wanted to show her I still had some power over myself. Instead, the words came out as a whimper. Nails. N Nails? I repeated. My thoughts turned to the marble sculptures and the tortures a little bit of sharp metal could inflict. What do you want nails for? I want your nails. Uh, oh. Okay. I was suddenly relieved. Uh, whatever. Uh, do you have any scissors? She laughed and shook her head. From behind her back, she produced a pair of pliers. No. I whispered. Yes. Not like that. Please, not like that. She pouted and held the pliers out to me. No nails, no kiss. I swallowed back a sob. I could already feel my heart beating out a maniac drumroll. The thought of what I had to do knocked me sick. The thought of not getting another kiss was like having red-hot needles pushed into every pore. I took the pliers. For a long while, I stood there, just looking at my hands. My consciousness seemed to be coming from somewhere else, as though I was watching my own body from another plane of existence. I closed the pliers on the nail of my left thumb and started pulling. The pain was unbearable. I watched through tear-blurred eyes as, millimeter by millimeter, a red line grew at the base of my nail. My fist clenched around the pliers and I pulled with all my strength, screaming with agony as I did. The nail moved less than a centimeter. I wasn't going to be able to pull it off in one go. That's it, she crooned. Just ease it out. Don't worry, it'll grow back. 
Minutes crawled by like hours. I screamed until I could only choke. With one last pull, the nail came free. My hands shaking and wet with blood and sweat. I put my thumbnail into her cupped hands. Despite the snot dribbling down my face, I leaned in for my kiss. She backed away. No, no, no. That's no good. I gave you my fucking nail. I cried. I hated her more than I thought was possible. I said I wanted nails. Plural. You have another thumb and eight fingers to go. I pulled at my hair, waiting with frustration, pain, and anger. She stepped forward and tussled my hair. Oh, poor little doggy doesn't want his kiss. I'm gonna grab for her. If she wouldn't give me a kiss, I'd take one from her. The moment my hands touched her, something like an electric shock passed through my hands and burned its way down to my feet. Searing agony knocked me to the ground. It took me a good fifteen seconds before I could breathe again. Just for that, she hissed. I'll have your toenails as well. Three months passed with no call. My last kiss had barely been enough to take the edge off the pain. As you might expect, my mother and sister were horrified when they found out what I'd done to my fingers and toes. They phoned the police straight away. I told the officer what I could. The description I gave had matched any number of women. My phone had no sign of any strangers calling or texting. The address I told them about revealed nothing but empty fields. None of that came as a surprise to me. I was pretty sure I'd gone way beyond the point where I could be shocked. Whoever the girl who kissed me was, I was certain she wasn't truly human. My drug test came back negative eliminating my family's theory that I'd started taking heroin or something. With the negative drug tests, the police quickly lost interest. They saw no reason to suspect I was being abused by my family and passed me over to the care of a psychiatrist. Telling the truth didn't make me feel any better, especially since nobody believed me. My sister figured I'd been rejected by a girl and had a breakdown. My psychiatrist was certain that my so-called succubus was entirely a creation of a disturbed mind. He theorized the red-headed girl was a rejection of deep-seated sadomasochistic fantasies. I was too preoccupied with my own suffering to pay much attention to the people around me. I shambled through life like a zombie. The physical effects of kiss withdrawal were crippling. My skin itched and burned. It felt like it was being bitten from within by an army of fire ants. Until my nails grew back, I'd resorted to scratching myself with a fork, leaving bloody trails down my arms and chest. My nightmares started to spill over into my waking life. Here and there, I'd see something scuttling on the edge of vision. Shadowy figures loomed over my bed, reaching out with taloned hands to torment me. I saw maggots in my food and centipedes in my drink. Life had become hell on earth. Then she came back. The knocking woke me in the middle of the night. Somebody was pounding on the front door with the force of a battering ram. Uh, Mom, the door, I said, still drowsy from my fitful sleep. Mom, Alex, could you see who's there, please? I swore and stumbled out of bed. I didn't hear any movement from my family, so I slipped on some clothes and went downstairs. I opened the door just as another set of knocks, knocks strong enough to crack the wood, started. A huge man in a suit stood in the doorway. He had the look of a bouncer or... He had the look of a bouncer or archetypal hired goon. She wants to see you, he said, in a voice too gentle for his appearance. I said nothing and looked past him. A black limousine was parked in front of my house, its windows tinted to stop anybody looking inside. I took a step back. Mom? I shouted. Panic started to overwhelm me. Alex? She has them, the man said. He sounded sympathetic. I'm taking you to see them. How? Where? I stammered, my mind struggling to put together a logical explanation for how my family could be kidnapped without me noticing. I gave in, 
Logic didn't apply to that demon. Come on, it's time to go. The man put a hand on my shoulder and led me towards the car. Partway there, when I'd managed to recover my senses a little, I asked him a question that had plagued me almost as much as my addiction. Who is she? She's... She's the worst thing that ever happened to me, the man said. He fought back a sob and squeezed my shoulder in an almost fatherly way. Just don't make her angry. Whatever you do, don't make her angry. He opened the back door of the limousine and waited for me to get in before heading over to the driver's seat. She was inside, clad in fur and diamonds like some sort of celebrity. She smiled and pushed a glass of wine into my hand. I didn't drink it. Let's talk business, she said as the limo started to move. I don't want another kiss. I want my family. Nobody wants another kiss. Not when they think it through rationally, at least. No, this is about craving. You don't want a kiss. You crave it. Deep down, I think you'd do anything for another kiss. Where's my family? They're safe. Not exactly comfortable, but they haven't come to any harm. I relaxed a little. Some instinct told me that, whatever she was, she couldn't lie. More precisely, whatever she said just had to be. You're a demon, aren't you? You're a succubus, she smirked. Poor little doggy. I'm more than a demon. I'm the monster of demons. Consort of the accuser. Queen bitch. So, you want my soul? I felt my mouth go dry as I said the words. It was like waking up to find out that the monster from your nightmare was stood by your bed. Clever boy. In return, I'll kiss you once a week, every week. After three long months of withdrawal, that has to be at least a little tempting, hmm? She was right about that. A kiss every week... I'd already been through hell. My soul couldn't be worth much. What was damnation compared with a kiss every week? All right. Deal. Good dog, she purred. So, what do I do? Shake hands? Sign my name in blood? No, that won't cut it, she said. There was a delight in her voice that made my blood run cold. You can't just give away your soul. You have to do something to lose it. I felt the limousine slow to a stop. The big man stepped out and opened the door for us. She stepped out first and offered me her hand. I took it. We walked across soft, damp grass towards a structure resembling a concrete garden shed. My heart threatened to break through my ribs as we got closer. I knew my family was inside. I knew she wanted me to hurt them. She opened the door. My mother and sister were bound to metal chairs. They'd been gagged, and tears streaked their faces. When they saw me, they tried to scream their pleas. My heart broke at the sight of them. Something cold and heavy was pressed into my hand. I looked down at the gun and started to weep. I, I can't. I said, turning towards the red-haired girl. I can't shoot them. Oh, you poor puppy, she said in a mocking sympathy. The gun isn't for them. It's for you. For me? Yes. It's for if you want to back out of the deal. Put the gun to your head, pull the trigger, and you have my word I let your family go. I didn't have to think about it. I aimed the gun straight at the bitch. She pulled a melodramatic face of shock. Oh, wow. Didn't see that one coming. Here's the thing. If you shoot me, I won't die. I can't die. What I can do is make damn sure you, your mother, and your whore sister 
spend many a long year just wishing you were dead. I turned the gun away from her and put it to my own head. My hands trembled and I heard my mother wail. Very noble. Sacrifice yourself to save your family. Better than just walking away and facing a life with no more kisses, right? She put a certain emphasis on the word kisses, and the effect was instantaneous. My mind turned straight to the thought of that first kiss. I couldn't shake the memory of just how good it was. She cocked her head and sneered. She knew she'd got me. Mind you, a kiss a week. Now that can be heaven on earth. It'd be cruel of your family to stand in the way of your happiness, wouldn't it? I sobbed with frustration and shame as I turned the gun towards my mother. I couldn't look her in the eyes. I tried to ignore her muffled screams as I pulled the trigger. The shot echoed across the countryside. I'd missed. The red-haired girl held my wrist, pointing the gun a foot above my mother's head. I stared at her in confusion. I told you the gun isn't for them. She hissed. She pried it out of my fingers and dropped it on the floor. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to all of you. I turned around at the sound of the big man's voice. I looked down at what he was holding and my heart sank. My family screamed. No. I whispered, anything but that. If you want your kisses, this is how I want you to surrender your soul. Please just let me use the gun. No. I took a few trembling steps towards the big man, knowing that I stood on the precipice of damnation, knowing that if I did what she wanted me to do, I deserved to go to hell. A kiss every week. Every week. I couldn't stop myself from thinking about it. I took the kerosene and matches. I think I'm the same as every guy out there. Or more so I think every guy is the same. We have an innate desire to fuck. Pardon the profanity. But I don't think I'll be able to tell this story without it. I differentiate between the desire to fuck and the desire to have sex or make love. They are two different things in my eyes. To delve deeper into my philosophy, the rapper Kanye West actually has a very insightful line that I believe describes the sexuality of man. I could have me a Naomi Campbell and still want me a Stormy Daniels. We may have a type of woman that we want to marry and have married sex with, no matter how crazy or unique. There will always be a deviant side to our sexuality that tells us to share a bed with less reputable women or men, and maybe experiment with a taboo. Despite the controversy surrounding Kanye and Daniels, the sentiment remains the same. I'm just another victim of this lustful nature all men have. We are all plagued by this, and I think no matter how normal, mature, disciplined, or moral the man or woman is, everyone has a kink to fundamentally unique sexual desire that can range from just wanting to participate in BDSM, wanting to fuck multiple people, role-playing, all the way to immoral and unethical practices I won't get into. This leads me to one kink I want to talk about specifically. I believe it's been around since man began worshipping the sun, but it really became a part of pop culture in the 70s when a cult, not to be confused with cults, although the two can mix, horror, thriller, sexploitation, and pornos entered the mainstream. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you should give it a search. Hell, you might end up liking it. Especially if Satan or Satanists and occultists having ritualistic, horrific, or raunchy sex with gorgeous men and women sounds like your thing. Just be prepared to see the occasional Euro Bush. On the topic of occult exploitation films, there is one film that isn't an occult film necessarily, 
but as some influence and undertones from that era. I think most, if not all of you reading this, have probably heard about it at some point. The film I'm talking about is the first VHS film. If you haven't seen it, basically the viewer is taken on a journey along with some shitheads who broke into a creepy house, and they watch a series of underground and rare VHS footage displaying very disturbing and surreal events. One of the stories is about a group of three college-age guys going clubbing and picking up chicks. The guys go to a club and invite a few chicks back home, one of which is a little strange, not only physically, but also seems to have trouble saying basic words. Long story short, she ends up killing the two Chad-type guys and kidnaps, or uh, should I say literally transforms into a demon humanoid figure and flies off with the skinny nerd archetype guy for, well, who knows what. The story is often referred to as the succubus story. I tell you this to give you an idea of what a succubus is, but I'm sure you have an idea of what a succubus is. A classic example are the sirens from Homer's Odyssey, whom sing so beautifully that men are drawn to their voices and, eventually, their death. All of this being said, now I can explain how all of this relates to me. My name is Ike, like Turner, and as you may have already picked up on, I have an obsession with sex and the occult. I believe my obsession with sex is healthy, and, like I said, I believe every man is, even if it is only secretly. My obsession with the occult, uh, I'm not so sure now. Although this is private information, I work and live in San Francisco and have decent social skills. Hard to believe, I know. I'm being blunt because I have to, so... I'm not the type that is into weird shit due to a lack of getting actual ass. The truth is, I just have a hard time connecting emotionally. This has led me down a rabbit hole of demonic and occult porn and an obsession with fucking something unnatural. This leads me to believe I wanted to fuck a succubus. I figured, you know, a succubus wants something like my soul or my life or some shit. I don't even care. I just had this burning desire telling me I want to be used by some paranormal, gorgeous, and maybe not even entirely human-looking creature. This led to a lot of sex with sometimes attractive, sometimes not. Sometimes sane and sometimes not. Goth, punk, straight-up eccentric chicks that were willing to do like- that were willing to do things like fuck in a pentagram or maybe carve one on me with a knife and get a little burning wax dropped on their bodies while we have some animal-like sex. Sometimes we'd even read this book containing occult, satanic, or witchcrafty ritual stories, and I gotta tell you, it might sound a little insane, even unsafe if you're afraid of that type of thing, but goddamn, that rush was phenomenal. The issue is that the rushes could never last at the rate I was going. I was lucky enough to meet one chick named Rabbit. Uh, this wasn't even a nickname. Her story is her parents were crack addicts who thought that the story of Peter Rabbit was cute and somehow saw the name Rabbit fitting for a girl. Her middle name was even worse, though. It was Jessica, so she decided that Rabbit was okay. I'm not going to lie, she wasn't all there, but she was nearly perfect. She had a non-existent attention span, and her hair was always matted and unkempt, despite it being a new color every week. She always looked tired and spent time at a local loony bin for attempting to murder one of her teachers, who she said made some unwanted advances on her. She said that he lied and said it was unprompted, and that it was her word against his. I believe her, of course, but she's still crazy. Despite all of this, she had some beautiful features, like a legitimately smoking body and, if I'm being a little sentimental, the most gorgeous hazel eyes I had ever seen. Anyway, we started hooking up and having some seriously satanic sex. We would get high on a multitude of drugs and read this book I found called Doctrina Satanas. I'm not an expert, but I believe that roughly translates to Satanic Doctrine. We would read all these crazy stories and these crazy rituals inside, 
partially translated by some secretive guy who most people say was a local Freemason. I knew things were getting unintentionally serious when we wouldn't even have sex some of the times we'd meet. We'd just read, laugh, talk about the types of forbidden knowledge we'd like to learn, and watch old horror movies together. Despite finally meeting someone, I felt I finally felt a weird connection to. I still couldn't satiate this hunger inside of me, telling me to keep going. I needed this sex to be more dangerous than just cutting pentagrams into each other, and stupidly saying shit in Latin we didn't quite understand because it might summon a demon. Although we know it wouldn't, because we weren't following the ritual to a T. It was all in good fun, but I wanted to go further. So I started reading some of the Doctrina Satanus on my own time in order to find something that might help me. In order to find something that might help me. For the first time in a long time, I felt focused. I would critically read and meticulously decipher the rituals and stories written in this book with the hopes that I find something that piques my interest. About a week ago, I finally found something. If I'm being honest, I was subconsciously hoping I'd find a succubus the whole time. I've always had a fixation with the harlots from the 70s, occult pornos, and the succubus from VHS. I guess that's why, when I found a section named Metatrix Demonium, it felt like everything was coming together. The translation literally means prostitute demon, or harlot demon. I'd like to think what it's actually saying is succubus. When I began reading and trying to decipher the story regarding this demon, my interest only skyrocketed. Long story short, I translated and deciphered the bits that weren't already and then dumbed it down to basically saying this. The prostitute demon, or succubus, is a demon whose main function is to punish those who delve too far down into the deadly sin of lust. The demon punishes men and women who participate in sinful and immoral sex practices by first seducing the individual. If the individual is a male, and if the demon can get its prey to ejaculate inside it, it then takes ownership of that person's soul. Upon acquiring this person's soul, it then reveals its true form if it hasn't already, sometimes resulting in immediate death due to shock and resulting in that individual serving as a slave for the rest of eternity, or until the demon releases them. If the person does not die upon completion of the act, they continue to live a normal life, but live knowing their eventual fate. I got excited just reading that. Upon translating this description with Google Translate and some other random translation sites, I wanted to see it. I wanted to fuck this thing. I didn't care about the consequences, if I could lay with this creature, even if I lost my soul. I felt I finally knew what my calling was. Of course, I would try and maintain my soul, but the rush of the whole thing is what really sold me. So I began reading on how to summon it. It was much harder to piece this part of the text together, and it was very vague, but the summoning process goes a little like this. The succubus summoning is either at the discretion of a higher-ranking demon, or when a heartbroken, angry, or ambitious lover performs the demon's sacrament. In either case, the target will not know the identity of the creature until completion of the demon's contract, in which the demon will reveal itself in its true intentions. In order to complete the demon's sacrament and the summoning the succubus, one will need to 1. Create a pentagram method and material not important. 2. At each point of the pentagram, there should be a wax candle burning. 3. Between the hours of midnight and 4 a.m., you must kill a human sacrifice. 4. Before taking the sacrifice's life, you must chant et ego in vocabo metatrix demonium mater profano sexus. 5. After the sacrifice's life has been taken, you must then chant, Videtur. Upon summoning, the succubus will often appear in a non-threatening and beautiful female form, and you will need to provide a possession of the target in order for it to prey upon the target. 
As soon as I understood these steps, I began acquiring the supplies. I decided I would perform the ritual in my living room, and that I would cover everything up to avoid a mess. I would then try to convince it to lay with me upon its arrival. If I gave it a possession of mine and said I was the target, it would work. Right. I bought red paint to make the pentagram, some generic wax candles for the ceremony, and plastic tarp to put on the furniture in case of blood splattering. The only thing I hadn't figured out was how to obtain a human sacrifice. I may be into some dark shit, but murder never crossed my mind before deciding I would do this. I didn't even know if I had it in me. So I began contemplating, and realized if I were to perform this ritual, I had to take it seriously. This meant that I had to find a sacrifice, and upon finding them, I couldn't back down. Occurring almost simultaneously with that thought, I received a text from Rabbit. It read, You want to hang out? I knew what I had to do. I realized she was probably the only victim suitable for this, and she is practically a nobody. She has no real friends and no family left. I replied to her, I was just thinking about you. I'd love to get into something weird tonight. Come over and let me show you this new story I found. She replied hastily. Wow, I didn't know you were capable of feeling something like love. I'll stop by in an hour. Try not to blow your load to the thought of me before that, alright? An hour. This is perfect, I thought. This would give me enough time to prepare the sacrifice. I decided I would use my butcher's knife and add a lot of crushed up painkillers into a drink in order to prevent a struggle. I prepared two glasses of whiskey, added the powder and placed them on the table. I put my drink on the left and hers on the right, and decided that I would pick mine off the table immediately upon her arrival, in order to eliminate a mix-up. After everything was ready, I sat in anticipation. Not too long after, the doorbell rang. It was about 10 o'clock. I could feel my palms getting clammy, and sweat formed on my scalp. After assuring myself that this is what I wanted to do, I went to the door. I answered it, and there was a rabbit as expected, standing in her normal semi-slouched posture. Her hair seemed washed today, and it was dyed completely purple. Her eyes were brighter than usual and she sported black lipstick to match her typical black makeup. She radiated a positive energy, despite the overwhelmingly goth-inspired outfit featured today. Upon seeing this unusually peppy rabbit, I froze for a minute in admiration, admittedly, then forced my head back into the game. This was no time to become unfocused or change my mind. We went into the living room, where I sat in my armchair, and she took a seat close to me on the couch. I immediately grabbed the drinks, offering her the one with the special stuff inside. So, what's the new story about? She said, her eyes wide open, not turning away or blinking. This was a common expression she wore. I, I believe it's about a succubus, I said bluntly. I took a sip of whiskey, so she did the same. She took only a small sip and made a disenchanted expression. The right corner of her mouth cracked a smile, though, signaling to me that everything was okay, and that she was interested in the story. This allowed me to relax a little bit, and so I was able to form an actual smile rather than a forced and rigid one. I see. You want me to play one, right? She said jokingly. I, uh, actually, I have something like that planned. Let me read you the story real quick. I read her the lore of the beast. I'm sure in a very animated and passionate way that happens involuntarily when I really like what I'm talking about. As I told her, her smile grew and grew, and her eyes grew brighter and brighter, almost giving off this aura of innocence I have never seen in her before. Once I finished, we sat still, staring at each other. I realized at this moment exactly just how wrong what I was doing really was. I realized I might even love this woman. Don't drink that, I said firmly yet ashamed. She maintained eye contact. 
She even maintained her smile. Instead of heeding my words, she began drinking the glass anyway, all without blinking her eyes. Her pupils began expanding to the point that they filled the entirety of her irises, destroying that bright, innocent look I just had. When she put the drink down, I noticed not only that she was still smiling, but her grin seemed to be getting larger and larger, until her lips opened up, revealing teeth that began to change form. Her teeth were transforming into a monstrosity that resembled a great white. She began laughing all without looking away from me, seemingly unfazed by the drug I had slipped into her drink, and with evil, entirely midnight black eyeballs, her voice changed. It was deep and loud, and yet the feminine voice was still layered underneath. What's wrong, Ike? Keep going. I want to hear the summoning ritual. She said in a mocking, highly amused tone. She continued to laugh at my expense, all the while I stared in bewilderment, unable to comprehend the horrendous transformation that just took place before my eyes. The pit in my stomach dropped, and I felt paralyzed, yet for some reason I felt relieved. Well, this saves me the trouble of killing you, I forced out. Her laughter paused, but she maintained that smile. She decided to walk closer to me, and for the first time I noticed that her nails had grown to the length of what looked like two inches. Are you the real rabbit, or... I asked, puzzledly. Yes. Some of the Dark Lords took notice of you a while back. So, I was hired to fetch your soul. Her appearance remained unchanged, but her voice returned to normal. But luckily for me, I haven't given you my soul yet, despite our history. So why reveal yourself now? I have no reason to hide now. You know why. She was right. She realized my infatuation with her, this monster, and knew that she would have my soul tonight regardless. Although now, being face to face with this danger, I began getting second thoughts. I decided to bluff. You're right. I want to ask you a favor, though. I suppose I'll... Listen. I want to see your true form. She laughed and then turned her back to me. After a moment, wings started to rip out of her back and out the back of her shirt. Her skin was morphing into a blackish-gray color, and when she turned around, her eyes were yellow and reptilian. Her nose was now just two slits, and her fiendish smile was now even larger. Her height grew nearly two feet, making her possibly seven and a half feet tall. Despite all of these changes, her figure remained feminine and humanoid. At this moment, she walked towards me and embraced my face. She had a look of sweetness behind this evil caricature, and I thought there was something beautiful about this form she was in. She began to speak to me. You know... One thing they never put in those books is the whole truth. It says we have to lay together in order for me to obtain your soul, as I can also just make you fall in love with me. I felt my heart drop. You were harder than most, I'll admit. I knew that when I did some background on you. I knew that this was the way to go, though. Rather than let you put your weak human hands on me again... At that moment, a tail I hadn't seen before instantaneously shot forward and into my stomach. I looked down, confirming that it pierced my body, then at her. She looked despicable and ecstatic with what she had just done. I'm going to take your soul, but don't worry, you'll see me again soon. As she said that, her tail ripped back out of my stomach, holding what looked like a faintly glowing aura. I never thought this soul would have a physical form. She then suddenly vanished into thin air, 
and like that, she was gone. That leads to now. I'm writing this as I bleed out. Luckily, the puncture was through my abdomen, where you can typically live the longest after an injury. However, I'm not going to lie to you. Getting your soul sucked out isn't what you think. I feel like all of my vitality and youth have been stripped from me, and any ambition and all will to live have literally and metaphorically been ripped out of me. I write to tell you all this. Don't get involved with a succubus. Just the cutest. My grandmother exclaimed in a bubbly tone as she booped the baby's nose. My aunt had just given birth, a baby boy. He squirmed around on the table, his back rubbing against the soft blanket. He swirled his tongue around, his eyes full of wonder as they darted around. My whole family loomed above him. My aunt, June, looked down at him with proud eyes. Her husband, my uncle, Luke, Almost shed a tear. My grandma, Mary, had this smile on her face, almost devilish. My grandpa, Danny, right next to her, like two peas in a pod. My mother stood next to me, her hands on my shoulders, my father standing behind her. I watched uncomfortably as they rubbed their hands across all the baby's body, admiring his soft skin. My throat slowly started nodding up. I jumped in my seat, my eyes twitching as my grandma raised up a shining blade and swung it down into the child's face. My neck cranked at the feeling of blood splashing against my cheek. The knife went completely through its head. The tip of the blade pressed into the wooden table. My grandma pulled the knife out, blood dripping off. I looked around at everyone. They were drooling over its corpse. My grandma slowly slid her tongue against the blade, licking off a sliver of blood. She pulled her tongue back into her mouth, her eyes rolling into the back of her head. Sweet youth, she moaned, a grin on her face. Dig in, my aunt chirped. My family knocked into my shoulders, rushing towards the body. They raised their knives and began slicing off limbs. Blood squirted across the table as they dismembered arms, flesh, and muscles stretching as it severed. I watched my grandma sink her teeth into the severed arm, blood trickling down her chin. She chewed slowly, savoring each bite. Her hair slowly began changing, the gray strands almost instantly changing to a grayish brown. Her wrinkly skin grew tighter and smoother. She looked like she had gone from 75 to 55. My grandpa tore a leg off, blood pouring down the table. He sunk his teeth into it like corn, pulling on strands of skin. And just like grandma, his frizzy gray hair began to transform colors, reverting to grayish blonde bald spots filled in with clumps of hair. His skin smoothed out. My mother and father didn't need very much, so they picked lightly. My mother reached over with a fork and picked one of the eyeballs, tucking it off of meaty strings. She observed the small, shiny eyeball and then plopped it in her mouth like a piece of gum. My father took the other eyeball, blood squirting out of the empty socket and dripping down the side of its face. My uncle reached over with his knife and opened the baby's mouth and yanked its tongue out of its mouth and began slicing it off with the knife. Blood filled its mouth and squirted down its neck as my uncle chewed on the tongue like fat from steak. They continued to pick it apart taking any limb or organ that fulfilled their insatiable desire. They began to slice it open after taking most of the outside. They slid down its stomach and pried its corpse open. These are the goods, like a piñata. My aunt choked as they dug their hands around its organs. They pulled out stringy intestines, slurping on them like sausages. And my grandma went right for the gold, tearing out its small heart. She raised it above her mouth, tilting her head back. She clenched the heart tightly, blood pouring down her mouth and to the sides of her face. My family cheered her on, as if she were chugging a beer at a frat party. 
she juiced out every last drop, licking excess blood off her lips. She then devoured the rest of the heart until there was no more. My uncle bit off pieces of lung like a pork chop. I watched as my family ravaged the corpse, blood smearing everywhere. I began to think about my siblings. I knew I had three of them, but I only remember one. I only ever met one. I don't even remember his name. I just remember playing with him one day, and he was gone the next. My train of thought broke when I noticed a head in front of me. My uncle dangled his head in front of me, soaked in blood. Between his fingertips, a small toe with a nail ripped off. I looked up at him, my eyes shaking. He had this soft, encouraging look on his face. It was disturbing. I couldn't push the words out. So my mother interjected. Oh please, she doesn't need that. She chuckled. Be grateful for that one, my uncle said, dropping the toe in his mouth. By the time they were done, the body had been picked clean. The only things left were bones and pieces of meat to save for later. I eyed the carcass, and it looked like it was attacked by rabid dogs. I looked around at my family. My grandpa and grandma looked young enough to be parents, and my aunt and uncle could pass as my older siblings. Maria, honey, why don't you go to bed? My mother said quietly, kissing the top of my head. I stood up, leaving the table, as my family bantered. I walked upstairs, the old stairs creaking as my feet hit each one. I went to the bathroom, quickly sliding in and shutting the door behind me. I turned the light on, and the room illuminating. I looked at myself in the mirror, my big brown eyes staring back at me. I scraped off the dried blood that splashed on my tan skin. I felt like crying. Why did I feel like crying? I've seen it before. It, it doesn't really get any easier. I, I understand, but do I? There was no point in questioning it. It was just one of those things. I should be grateful that they didn't choose me, that my parents chose parenthood over youth. I left the bathroom. Walking back to my room, I slowed my pace down when I heard the faint sound of grainy breathing. I looked around the dark hallway. I looked at the door next to me. The sound was coming from behind it. And then I remembered. My great-grandma Lorraine. She's been on the brink of death since the 90s. They always intended to involve her in the feast every time, but they get selfish and end up barely giving her scraps. Being in old age for over a decade has crippled her. She sits in her room and never leaves. They bring up slices of skin and chunks of meat on a plate like a dog. I know they don't care about her, only about the bloodline. I entered my room and plopped onto my bed, my body sinking into the cold, soft mattress as I drifted off to sleep. I wake up suddenly, startled by the sound of arguing. I open my eyes slowly, and my eyeballs feeling dry. I slowly sat up, still a bit dazed, I overheard a loud conversation. It's not fucking working anymore, my grandpa exclaimed, his voice muffled to the floors. Did she eat any at all? My uncle asked. Yes, and it didn't do anything, my grandpa answered. Does it ever do anything? My mom snarled. Don't be fucking stupid. It's kept her barely alive for years. Why isn't it working? His rage grew followed by a bang against the table. Calm down. Why didn't you save more? My dad chimed in. Why didn't you save more? Why didn't any of you save more? He barked back. Please just shut up. She's been alive for this long. She can go a little longer without. My aunt groaned. I knew they were talking about my great grandma. I guess they got a little too selfish this time. She... she can't die. She's my mother, for Christ's sake, he shouted. We'll figure something out, my mom suddenly interjected. They stayed silent for a moment, my ears wide open. The girl, my grandma suddenly proposed. What? My grandpa asked, annoyed. 
Maria. She's young enough. Good amount of meat on those bones. A creaky voice explained. My body went numb as the words flowed through my ears. They couldn't have been serious. No. We made a deal. My mom growled, her voice beginning to shake. We did it with the others. She'll understand. We're family. My grandma tried to convince her. Fuck that. She's family. My daughter, you fucking hag. Don't ever try that again. My mom attacked. I flinched at the sound of a smack that rang through the floorboards. We brought you into this family. You are where you are today because of us. My grandma hissed. There was silence for a moment. We did it with the others previously. This is just how it has to be. My uncle reassured her. I'm not doing this. Touch her and I'll fucking eat you instead. My mom declared. The sound of pounding footsteps following. We'll get her in a few hours. It'll have to be a bit of a surprise. She won't cooperate. My grandma planned. My heart dropped into my stomach. I needed to make a move. Now. I threw my blanket off of myself and hopped out of bed. I stepped onto the floor, squinting my eyes after realizing I might have stomped too hard, praying it wasn't loud. No other noises followed, so I started throwing around ideas in my head. I tried to map out the layout of my house in my head. Six family members looking for me. My brain scrambled when I heard the sounds of multiple footsteps. I quietly opened my door, sliding out of my room quickly. I observed the long hallway, and no one was in sight. My house is pretty much a mansion, a courtesy of my great-grandmother's fortune. I slowly walked down the hall, my socks sinking into the old carpet. I heard muffled whispers beneath the floor. My best bet would be to sneak down the stairs and bolt out the front door. I crept closer to the staircase, trying not to alert anybody of my presence. Suddenly, my aunt turned the corner as she reached the top step. I froze in place, my heart racing. She turned to look at me, silent for a moment. A grin grew on her face. Maria, there you are. Could you please come downstairs and help with the cleanup? Your poor Aunt June's back is taking a toll. She let out a try-hard giggle. I thought for a moment, trying to plan my next move. Then I realized, they don't know that I know. I straightened my posture, closing my widened eyes, but my guard was still up. Sure. Uh, can I go to the bathroom quickly? I asked. Yeah. Actually, can I come in with you quickly? Gotta grab some ibuprofen. She smiled, tilting her head to the side. Bitch. I nodded and walked over to the bathroom. She wouldn't walk next to me only ominously behind me. I looked out of the corners of my eyes as I entered the bathroom. I'll grab it quickly and be out of your hair. She approached the medicine cabinet. Stupidly, I let my eyes off of her when I looked down at the toilet, noticing the creaking pipes. All of a sudden, I felt hands push me over with full force. I yelped as I slipped on the tile floor, trying to grab the toilet to regain balance. My hands slipped as well. My forehead crashed into the side of the bathtub. The impact rippled through my head. Blood began to trickle down my face. I slowly opened my shaking eyes, my vision blurry. Just make this easy, she groaned as I felt her kneel behind me. She balled a clump of hair in her fist and pulled my head back. I looked up, blood sliding past my eye. Just a sliver and some more. Her mouth stretched into a sinister smile as I saw a knife go towards my arm. Still dizzy from the hit, I used all my strength I had and swung my elbow, knocking into her nose. She fell off of me, on her knees, leaning over the tub next to me. I stood up, almost falling backwards. I blinked tightly a few times, trying to clear my vision. I looked down and she was covering her nose with her two hands, the knife on the floor next to her. It was too risky. 
She released her hands, placing them on the lining of the tub to help her get up. Before she could lift herself up, I raised my leg and dropped my foot on top of her head. Her head crashed down, her mouth ricocheting against the lining. A knocked out tooth sliding into the tub. I quickly whipped around and dashed out of the room. I ran for my life down the hallway, finding any room to run into. You little cunt. Danny. Her cries echoed out from the bathroom. I continued to run, my feet stomping, then halted harshly almost leaving tire marks when I hit a dead end, the only door left on this side of the floor. I looked behind me, waiting for a furious ant to come for blood. I heard quick footsteps run up the stairs. Oh my god, what happened? My uncle asked. I turned back around and barged into the room. I shut it behind me quietly, trying not to give away my location. I looked around the room and it was pitch black. I dragged my hands across the walls to feel for the light switch, and when I flipped the switch under my fingers, I flipped out. The room illuminated. I was in one of the dozens of living rooms, couches you weren't allowed to sit on, tables you'd get crucified for if you set a drink down on them. The room painted a light maroon, the fancy sofas a bright pink. I looked around for any windows to escape, but they were all too small to escape through. I quickly noticed the two medieval armor statues that stood like guards together at the back of the room. I walked towards them, feeling like they were going to get possessed and leap at me like in Scooby-Doo. The light reflected off of their shining silver armor, their hands clasped together, holding long swords like canes. I kneeled down, dragging my finger down the side of the blade. I raised my finger up, noticing blood coming from a paper cut sized incision. They're real. I noticed the blood from my head dripping off my chin. I wiped the stream of blood that ran down my face, smearing it on the back of my hand. I stood up and looked behind me at the door. I haven't heard a sound since I escaped my aunt. I looked back at the statue. Suddenly, a light bulb lit up above my head. I grabbed the statue's fingers. They were easily adjustable. I pulled them back one by one until I stepped aside as the sword dropped to the floor. I grabbed the handle with two hands and tried to lift it. Jesus Christ! I groaned as the sword had an unexpected weight. I felt my face turn red as I tried to lift it above my head, but my arms gave out and I had to drop it to the floor. I panted as I tried to catch my breath. I could lift it at least up to my stomach. I realized how loud the sword was when I heard footsteps quickly approaching the room. My eyes widened as I began dragging the sword over to the door. I quickly ran over and turned off the lights, planting myself in front of the door, lifting up the sword and holding it like a spear. I aimed the tip towards the entryway, waiting for someone to walk. The footsteps grew closer, the pounding shaking the floor. I tightened my grip, my arms shaking, my gaze locked. The footsteps reached the door, the doorknob slowly turning. The door flew open, light outlining the silhouette of a man standing in the hallway. Where the fuck are you? My uncle called out. I put all of my might into it, cutting off his words as I rammed the sword through his stomach. He let out a drop of air as it escaped his lungs. His mouth dropped open. I slowly trekked closer to him, pushing against his weight as I impaled the sword deeper into him. Blood began trickling out of his mouth. A look of fear glimmered in his eyes. I pushed the sword far enough that the base of the handle prevented me from pushing any further. He looked down at me, the life leaving his eyes. He tried lifting his hand, his skin losing color. He reached for my neck, lifting his other hand as well, and before he could get a hold of me, he collapsed to the ground, the sword still inside of him. I looked down at his corpse, my chest pumping, a pool of blood forming under him. I couldn't believe I had just done that, but it oddly didn't feel bad. No, a voice cried out from down the hallway. I looked down the hallway, my aunt stood, a knife in her hand. Her light brown hair was frizzy, looking like a bird's nest. I could see a broken heart in her eyes as she watched me standing over her husband's body. 
The heartbreak quickly transitions to rage. Her jaw was shaking with anger, her mouth covered in dried blood. She slowly raised up the knife, looking bloodthirsty. I stared her back down, trying not to show fear when I was really just frozen. She broke into a sprint, letting out an ear-piercing cry as she flew down the hallway. My fight or flight kicked in, and before she could reach me, I slammed the door shut and locked it. I jumped back as the knife pierced through the door. You little shit. I'll fucking gut you. She screamed from behind the door, retracting the knife and stabbing it back through. I looked around for something to defend myself. I, I didn't have enough time or strength to grab the other sword. My time was cut off when she began kicking the door. I slowly stepped back, eyes still on the door, trying to back up as far as possible. I could tell adrenaline was running through her veins when the door gave in after three kicks. The door swung open, the knob crashing into the wall. She stood in the doorway, her upper body moving up and down. She was breathing like a beast. I walked around the sofas, standing behind the small glass coffee table. She began walking after me quickly. I sidestepped quickly, trying to run her in a circle around the sofas. With no defense, she caught up to me quickly, grabbing my hair before I could turn around and making a run for it. I screamed as she threw me backwards, dropping me onto the glass. The thin glass instantly shattered behind me. My back pressed against hundreds of shards. Before I could try and get myself up, she pounced on top of me like an animal. Our gazes crossed. Her eyes lit with fire. I'll save her, this one. She hissed through her teeth, raising the knife up high. Her knees pressed into my stomach. I struggled to reach for a piece of glass. I stretched my arm out, but couldn't get a grip on a big piece. She swung down, my impulse reaction being to raise my hand up. I blocked the knife with my hand, the blade going through my palm. The blade pierced entirely through, the handle pressing against the wound. Not able to squeeze out a scream, the shock numbing the pain, I watched as blood trickled into my face. I quickly snatched a big chunk of glass and jabbed it into the side of her neck. The look of anger on her face dropped as blood squirted into my hand. Using all of my strength, I gripped the shard tightly and dragged it across her neck, blood pouring out as I left a rigid gash that ran across the entire front of her neck. When I reached the other side of her neck, I ripped the shard out, leaving a wound deep enough to hit her windpipe. A long cut imprinted from the glass pressed against my hand. She fell over, gargling blood in her mouth, slowly stood up, tripping on shards of glass. I looked down at her body the youth slowly leaving her. Strands of gray hair grew back, small wrinkles forming on her skin. The pain finally hit me as I looked at my hand. The knife still stabbed through. I took a deep breath and held it as I tightly gripped the handle. I slowly pulled the knife out, the sound of metal grinding against flesh and bone. Fuck! I shrieked in pain as I took the knife out. Tears streaming down my cheeks as I lifted up my shaking hands, blood streaming down my arms as I observed the massive hole the knife left. I had no time to cry as I heard footsteps running upstairs. They had heard my scream. I quickly ran out of the room, keeping the knife as a weapon, and down the hallway. I needed to get out of the house. Before I could turn the corner, someone quickly grabbed my hand and snatched me inside of a dark closet. I squirmed around, punching and kicking everywhere, swinging the knife around. Who is this? I'll fucking kill you! I threatened as I twisted and turned. Suddenly, hands grabbed my shoulders, trying to get me to stop wriggling. Shh, it's me, my mother whispered reassuringly. I stopped moving at the reassuring sound of her voice. Oh, thank God. Everyone's going fucking insane. I've literally killed Uncle Danny and Aunt June. Oh my god, I killed them. I panicked, the situation truly setting in. It's okay, you did what you had to do. Another voice reassured me. I realized my father was in here as well. What are you guys doing in here? I asked quietly. I'm assuming you know. The plan. I stormed away up here. Your father and I talked in here for privacy. 
When we heard the fighting, we stayed out of fear, she explained. What do we do? I begged for a plan. I, I don't know. There's no way to make it downstairs, she added on. I just want to get out of here. I quietly sobbed. My father stayed silent for a moment. It sounded like he was choked up. I I'm sorry. I love you. But it's for the family. He suddenly declared. What? I questioned confusedly. Don't do this. My mother pleaded breathlessly. What? What's going on? I began to panic. She's in here, my father called out. My whole body sank. I felt like I was spiraling in a dream. He threw the door open and shoved me out in the hallway, dropping the knife inside of the closet. I stumbled around, falling against the wall. The sound of running came from downstairs, sounding like bulls. I regained balance and began running back to the room where my aunt and uncle laid to rest. Stop! My father called out to me. I stopped dead in my tracks, my entire body shaking. I slowly turned around, my cheeks soaked with tears. My father stood at the other end of the hallway, a rifle in hand aimed at me. I froze like a deer in headlights. He kept his aim steady, his eye looking to aim. Please, don't do this. I begged through my tears. As he was about to pull the trigger, my mother came out from the closet and lunged at him. She leaped out of the closet, slicing his waist with a knife. I jumped where I stood as the bullet just missed me, hitting the door frame behind me. He turns to my mother, a look of fury painted his face. You stupid whore, he roared, hitting her with the stock of the rifle. She cried as she fell to the ground, blood dripping onto the carpet. He swung it up, hitting his chin and knocking her on her back. He stood over her, holding the rifle with two hands and began bashing it into his face. No, no, stop! I cried out, barely able to get the words out. I watched with empty lungs as he repeatedly bashed her face in. Her nose snapped to the side, eventually caving into her face. Blood splattered across the floor, her eyeball beginning to pop out. The sight was nauseating, but I had no time to mourn. I tried running down the hall and past him, but he put a hold on bashing your face in and swung the rifle into the back of my head as I flew past him. I groaned as I tumbled to the ground, my face burning as my skin rubbed against the carpet. I felt his pounding footsteps coming towards me. I took a chance at making a hit and kicked my foot back. My timing was perfect and my foot rammed into his ankle. Fuck! He groaned in frustration. And before he could stand up, I grabbed the gun from his hands and knocked him on the top of the head with it. He fell to his knees, his hands planted on the ground, blood trickling through his dark hair. I stood in front of him, the rifle in my hands. I lifted his chin up with the barrel of the rifle, looking at him in the eye. The fire in his eyes had been blown out. He looked scared now. I crammed the barrel into his mouth. He gurgled as the cold metal filled his mouth. I tilted the gun down, aiming the barrel up. He looked up at me with pleading eyes, but I barely gave it any thought as I pulled the trigger. The bullet burst through the top of his head. Blood and brain matter flew through the air. I flinched as blood and chunks hit my face. I retracted the gun, and he fell over, the hole in his head pouring blood onto the carpet. What have you done? A voice cried out from the end of the hallway. I looked up. My grandpa stood at the end of the hallway, his hand gripped tightly on a hay hook, presumably from our barn. He looked around, observing my body count, a look of horror on his face. He came storming down the hall, quickly stopping in his tracks when I raised up the rifle. I aimed him down, keeping him where he stood. I pulled the trigger, but the gun only clicked. I looked down at the gun in confusion and pulled the trigger again. It clicked. He was out of bullets. I looked up at him, and he laughed at me. 
he began walking towards me again. I dropped the gun, looking around me with the looking around me with the mere seconds I had to find something else to defend myself. The knife was nowhere to be found. I thought my mother may have fallen on top of it, but I didn't have time to move her body. I swiftly ran into the closet, grabbing anything I could find in the darkness. My hand grazed across a wooden baseball bat. I snatched it quickly, until the jarring sensation of a blade dug into my shoulder. He had swung the hook into my skin, leaving me screaming in agony as he pressed his foot against my back. Pulling the hook in deeper, he yanked it back, knocking a windless scream out of me and dragging me back into the hallway. I tried to keep my grip on the baseball bat, but it slipped out and plopped right outside the door frame. I wriggled as he dragged me out, the hook feeling like it was about to tear right through my skin. He dropped me, blood soaking through my shirt. He vigorously ripped the hook out from my skin, earning another agonizing scream from me. I placed my hand over the oozing wound, squinting, squinting my tear-filled eyes. He raised his arm up ready to gouge my eyes out. I swiftly rolled over, just missing his attack. The hook pierced through the carpet and into the wooden floor. He groaned as he struggled with pulling it out, as it got caught on strings from the torn carpet. I stood up wobbly, growing dizzy from the blood loss. I stumbled over to the closet and grabbed the baseball bat. I lifted it up, swirled it in the air, and aimed it down, building up a good enough swing before he could get the hook out. He looked up at me. I swung the bat up, slamming it into his chin. He stood up, his legs moving like jelly. His back slammed against the wall. I had caved his jaw in. Teeth fell out, along with a waterfall of blood. The crunchy sound of broken bones as he tried to open his mouth. The youth was slowly leaving him. Wrinkles grew quickly. Strands of hair growing from blonde to gray, patches of hair retracting into his scalp and forming bald spots. He looked like a grandpa again. I lowered the blood-soaked bat again and hit him with another uppercut, his head splitting off his body, jumping up with his spine attached to it like a toy. His head slid back down into his neck, and he stumbled around, blood circling down his entire neck. He collapsed to the ground, blood pouring everywhere. I stood over him, my heart and lungs on fire. I couldn't believe I had just done that. He broke like porcelain. I dropped the bat with tired hands and looked for the knife. It was an easier and more lethal weapon. I approached my mother's corpse. Her bloody face caved in. I wiped a tear that came quickly. She saved me. The only family member who wasn't trying to eat me. I rolled her body over. Weakened from all the wounds, the knife was hidden under her body. I grabbed it and stumbled down the hallway. I flew down the steps, tripping on a few of them. I limped towards the front door, the feeling of escape so close. I grabbed the cold metal handle. I took a deep breath, trying to keep myself conscious, and I turned the knob and cracked open the door. The sweet taste of freedom turned sour as I felt a sharp pain in my upper arm. I began to scream, my shout growing louder as the pain grew stronger. I looked over, and my grandma was sinking her teeth into my arm, her eyes rolling into the back of her head, my arm spazzing from the pain, my grip on the knife loosening and dropping it to the ground. She collected a clump of bloody flesh in her mouth and began to pull on it my skin and muscles stretching like gum. I fell to my knees, screaming until my throat practically bled. She pulled farther until my skin gave out and broke off. She chewed on the chunk of meat, swirling it around in her mouth like a piece of steak. She threw her head back, moaning in pleasure as she fed off my youth. Her hair grew longer, the gray strands vanishing, and her skin looking baby soft. She reached her peak age once again. She cackled devilishly as I looked down in horror at the gushing wound she left. I swiftly grabbed the knife off the ground and sliced her ankle. You little bitch, she exclaimed in pain. I tried to open the door and run away as far as I could, but I was too slow. She wrapped her hand around my neck 
dragging me back and choke slamming me to the ground, the knife slipping out of my hands, sliding just out of reach. She sat on top of me, wrapping both hands around my neck. She slowly squeezed tighter and tighter, completely blocking my windpipe. Tears in my eyes filled to the brim as I felt the blood trapped in my head. I coughed up saliva as I wriggled around to break free. She stared down at me, flashing her teeth with a ferocious smile as she awaited my demise. She leaned in closer. I love watching the life fade out of the young, like draining blood from a chicken. She sniggered as I slowly began to black out. I made one last attempt at survival before she crushed my windpipe. I stretched my hand out, my fingers about to detach as I reached for the knife. I grazed the handle of the knife with my fingertips. It was so close. The energy in my arm grew weaker as my neck tightened in her clutch. Right before my life began flashing before my eyes, I got a decent grip of the knife. She began opening her mouth wide, ready to bite down on my face and feast. Before she could, I lifted up the knife with every bit of life left in me and shoved the blade into her mouth. Blood immediately began pouring out of her throat and onto my face. Her grip slowly began to let go, my throat clearing up space to breathe. I took in as many breaths as I could as I slowly pushed the knife deeper. She choked up blood, squirting it onto my face as I pierced the knife through the back of her throat. I twisted the knife around, the blade grinding against her teeth. She fell over, her grip entirely loosened. I took in a breath so deep it could have popped my lungs. I could feel the blood flowing back through my body. I coughed up a bit of bloody saliva. I looked over at her corpse. Her hair turned to frail silver again, and her skin wrinkly and bleak, and her skin wrinkly and baggy. I did it. I survived. Everyone. I disorientedly stood up. The sudden movement too much for my body to handle. I approached the door. The coolness of the handle soothed my hand. But before I could leave, I remembered I had forgotten something. I leaned down and pulled the knife out from my grandmother's throat, blood spurting out from her throat and across the tan wooden floor. I limped upstairs, walked down the hall. I looked at the bodies as I passed them. When I reached the room, I could hear my great-grandmother's dying breaths. I slowly opened the door, the light from the hall peering into the dark room. My great-grandma sat in a wheelchair, one they never cared to let her move around in. I approached her with a stare. You would have thought she was dead if her lungs weren't pumping. She didn't look at me. I didn't think she even knew I was there. I tilted my head just staring at her as she slowly breathed with a deep wheeze. It was a strangely peaceful connection for a moment. But all good things come to an end. I cranked my arm back and swung the knife into the side of her head. The blade went straight through, the tip of it pointing out the other side of her face. She didn't look any different than when she was alive. Blood trickled down the side of her face as she slumped over in her chair. I stayed silent, watching her corpse lie. I stood and thought to myself for a moment. Fuck this family. I stumbled back down the steps. Half of my body's blood supply spilled across the house. My grandmother's corpse still laid near the front door, her death long awaited. I limped past her, blood dripping off the sole of my shoe as I stepped in the pool. I reached for the door with a heavy hand, trying to at least get outside before I fainted from my injuries. My vision slowly grew fuzzy as I stumbled forward, grabbing the doorknob to keep myself up. The knife clanked against the floor as it slipped from my weak grip, my arm resting by my side. I sat on my knees, resting my head against the door as I took deep, slow breaths. 
I couldn't give up now. I did too much to get where I was. I gripped the knob tightly, groaning as I lifted myself up. I slowly creaked the door open, my eyelids impulsively squeezing shut as the bright sunlight beamed. I slid out the door, the cool air satisfying to breathe. I lifted my head, closing my eyes and taking savory breaths. I hadn't gotten the chance to just breathe. I quickly collapsed to my knees, pressing my blood-soaked palms against the concrete pathway. My jaw trembled as tears welled in my eyes. It felt like everything had just hit me. I... I killed everyone. I killed my entire family. The thought forced tears out of my eyes. It was a fight for survival, but at what cost? I let myself sob. I deserved to feel something else other than anger. When I emptied the sadness from my body, I wiped off my damp cheeks, weakly getting on my feet. I sniveled as I looked around my gated community. Nobody was outside, but I needed help. I staggered off my front porch and into the street. I went for the first house that was directly across mine. The car was in the driveway. I almost tripped up the smooth stone steps as I approached the big metal doors. With all my strength, I pounded against it. Please, help me, I pleaded. My simple cries felt over-exaggerating, but there was no response. I banged again, my arms ready to drop. Please, I'm injured badly, I cried, breathing heavily. Suddenly, the sound of clicking heels came tapping towards the door. My eyes widened with hope until the door wasn't open. I eyed the side of the house, catching the resident peeking through their pulled back curtains. She didn't look worried or panicked. She looked disgusted. I stared back in silence, a beg for help gleaming in my eye. She threw the curtains back, her footsteps leading towards the door. She inched the door open, just enough to fit her head through. I don't know what dumpster you dragged yourself out of, but get off my property before I call security. How'd you even get in here? She warned. I'm literally your... I tried to explain, but she slammed the door shut. I stood in shock. Did she not recognize me? With a drop jaw, I stumbled off her front porch and tried another house, and another house, and another house. Each ignored my life pleas, told me to fuck off, or weren't even home. After my last attempt, I gave up, standing aimlessly in the street like a lost dog. If nobody was going to help me, I needed to help myself. I made my way back to that wretched house, hoping it was my last time. I sighed as I threw the door open, seeing my grandmother's corpse once again. I wished she'd just vanish, like a dead enemy in a video game. I limped up the stairs again, back into the blood-painted hallway. The bodies were still spread across the ground, the blood drying into the fabric of the carpet. I needed to find a phone, which is actually harder than you'd think. My great-grandmother owned the house, so all rules were written by her. She felt that house phones would allow spirits of the house to speak to us, so we never had those. I wasn't allowed my own cell phone because... I could get one when I was able to pay for my own, so that made this even harder. I had to take the bet that one of my family members had their phones on them. I started with my parents' corpses. They laid close to each other. My father's brain matter dried to the carpet. I kneeled down, almost losing my balance, and began pilfering through every pocket. Nothing. <sighs> even in death, he was fucking useless. I turned to my mother's corpse, pausing for a moment. I couldn't avert my gaze from her decimated face. The sight churned my stomach. She deserved better. I held back tears as I searched through her pockets, ending up with nothing. I stood up, making my way towards my aunt and uncle. After checking my uncle's corpse, I was left with my aunt. I stepped over her corpse, approaching the mess that I left my aunt in. I carefully danced around the shards of glass that scattered across the ground. I reached down, sliding my hand into her pocket. My eyes shot open as my finger grazed the corner of a phone. I quickly grasped it, trying to slide it out of her tight jeans. Suddenly, 
My legs gave out. I groaned and I dropped to the ground, grabbing the frame of the table to keep myself up. I wasn't getting any stronger. I needed to act fast. I lifted myself back up, my arms shaking. I used my other hand to pull the phone out, and then stumbled out of the room. I dabbled my fingers against my shoulder wound, baring my teeth as it stung. Blood covered my fingertips. I was still bleeding badly. I wiped them off against my pants and kept walking. I walked down those steps for the last time, feeling as hard as ever to do so. I stepped outside, looking behind me as I closed the door. I lifted the phone, praying it wasn't dead. I sighed with relief and a smile as it turned on. Thank God old people don't put passwords on their phones either. I opened the phone app and dialed 911. I raised the phone to my ear, tapping my teeth together as it rang. 911 operator, what's your emergency? A woman on the other end asked. I I have a medical emergency. I I have multiple injuries, I explained. What is your address? She went on. I told her my address, explaining that I'm in a gated community. An ambulance is on their way, she informed me. Uh, Okay, thank you. I sat down on my curb, feeling dizzy. She asked me a few more questions about my injuries and what happened. It was hard explaining that my entire family tried to murder me and feast on my corpse. I eventually hung up the call, waiting for the ambulance to arrive. I looked around my street with tired eyes. It was so dull you'd think it was abandoned. All the trimmed bushes and parked Cadillacs don't cover the fact that everyone hated each other and thought they were better than everyone. After a few minutes, the thought of the sound of sirens broke me out of my thought cloud. The ambulance pulled up in front of my house, the colored lights spinning. I stood up and two men hopped up. Thank you. My words trailed off as I suddenly felt numb. I collapsed to the ground, my vision blurry and my head muffled. She's losing a lot of blood, one of the men exclaimed in panic, motioning for the other to get a stretcher. They pulled it out of the back of the ambulance, lifting me onto it. My eyes slid around, my eyelids desperately wanting to close. I looked at the blue sky and the faces of the panicked men carrying me. It was hard for me to make out what they looked like. Everything was fuzzy. They lifted me into the ambulance, a woman sitting on the back with me. She lifted my head, strapping a mask to my face, and began pumping something into my lungs. Within seconds, I felt exhausted. My vision blurred even further, and everything in a mist. But before I blacked out, it's funny. I looked at the woman, and I could have sworn she had three eyes. I slowly opened my eyes, staring at a blurring ceiling. I was laying down comfortably, my back supported by a soft bed. I reached up to rub my eyes, quickly feeling the weight of tubes that ran into my arms. I wiped the fuzziness from my vision, blinking rapidly. I made it to the hospital without dying. I looked over at the heart rate monitor as it beeped, mesmerized by the green bar as it rose and dropped to my heartbeat. There were wrinkled green curtains that separated the beds for privacy. Nurses fast walked by, masks covering their mouths. I reached up to touch the bandage on my forehead, flinching as it stung. Oh, you're awake. A nurse suddenly exclaimed as she noticed me. She walked over, a clipboard in hand. How are you feeling? She asked. Uh, uh, Like shit. I chuckled weakly, wheezing as I coughed. That's the usual with injuries like these, she said, leaning down towards me. How long was I out for? I questioned. A short three hours, I think, she answered, jotting something down. I'm going to change your bandages. This might sting a bit, she warned me. She gripped the gauze, my eyes shooting open as she applied unexpected pressure. I held in cries as she pressed into my wound, vigorously ripping off the bandage. I couldn't tell if she was extremely inexperienced or she did it on purpose. She dangled the crimson-soaked cloth, then dropped it into her pocket. She pulled out a clean gauze and medical tape. I almost shot up out of bed and she pushed the gauze against my wound, practically shoving her finger into it. Please, less pressure, I pleaded. Sorry, honey, it'll be just a moment. She ignored my request. 
She taped it down, my shoulder throbbing as she ran her finger over to make it stick. I squeezed my eyes, a tear running down my cheek. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I didn't mean to be so rough. She apologized, her tone ditzy. She grated her thumb across my cheek, wiping away my tear. With a smile, she began walking away. I stared at her in confusion and a bit of shock. Why did she manhandle me? Then I caught something strange. As she turned the corner, almost behind the curtain, she put her thumb in her mouth and licked it clean. Did she just eat my tears? I thought to myself, absolutely baffled. I uncomfortably shifted around to my bed, my shoulder raging with pain again. I stayed observant like a hawk for a few hours the nurse never returning since. In my time, I noticed a few things. First of all, the place seemed extremely understaffed. I think the only nurse I saw walk back and forth was the one that practically abused me. And a man walked by a few times, seemingly a doctor, but that was it. The only people that worked on this floor. Speaking of floors, I never saw anyone leave this one. From my viewpoint, the hospital seemed to be in a T-shape. The rows of beds were at the top, and then one long hallway that leads to other rooms, then the staircase and elevators. My bed resided in front of that hallway, giving me a bird's eye view. I had not seen one person enter or exit the staircase, uh, neither the elevator. And I thought I was overreacting. I lost a lot of blood, so I didn't exactly possess clarity, but I came from a family of psychotic cannibals. I could smell suspiciousness, like a drop of blood in a bottomless ocean. The one thing that stayed under my skin was the nurse. A medical professional could not be that reckless. She was like a caricature. My tears, she licked it off her finger. Everything just felt so strange, like I was on an episode of the Twilight Zone. I knew I sounded paranoid, nitpicking with these observations till I was visited by the nurse. It was around 7 p.m., the sun almost set. She smiled as she appeared around the curtain, holding an IV bag. I faked a smile. We meet again, she joked. I nodded, letting out a stale chuckle. I'm going to change your IV for the night, she explained, unhooking the old bag. She then reached for my arm, giving me a moment before she pulled the needle out. This might hurt a bit. It's okay to scream or cry. She tried to reassure me. I'll be fine. I croaked, her comment rubbing me the wrong way. She unwrapped the tape, gripping the needles that were buried in my arm. Suddenly, she tore them out of my arm. A scream escaped my mouth as I almost flew off the bed. I looked down at my arm with wide eyes, blood squirting out of the holes. Oh my god, I'm so sorry. She apologized, reaching in her pocket for gauze pads. I glared at her like she was insane. My jaw dropped. She ignored my gaze and pressed the pads against my wound. The white cloth quickly ran red as my gushing blood soaked into it. While holding it down, she used her other hand to pull out tape, tearing off a piece and using it to keep the gauze down. That should stop the bleeding eventually. She straightened her back. I continued to stare at her in shock. I couldn't believe what she had just done. She pulled the needle out like a plug from an outlet. She was about to walk away until she turned to me. She stared at me intensely, like she was studying my face. Her expression showed that a thought ran through her head. You're a tough cookie, aren't you? She smirked, sounding scornful. I kept silent, continuing to stare. She eventually walked away, my eyes following her until she disappeared. I looked down at my arm, groaning as I bent it. It wasn't the worst of my injuries, but it felt like a really intense bruise. I didn't know where I was going to go, but I needed to get the fuck out of there. I waited until the lights turned off and the floor was clear. When the time was right, I slowly slid off the bed. Goosebumps ran across my skin as my bare feet touched the cold, polished floors. I peered past the curtains not having seen past them. I looked left and right. 
perking up like a dog as I noticed a beaming red exit sign. I stepped out from behind the curtain, tiptoeing towards the exit. I would just go through the door, fly down the steps, and escape to... somewhere. As I continued down the pathway, I looked over, slowly stopping. The beds were empty. I backtracked a bit, realizing that every bed was empty. Where are the other patients? I shook it off and continued on towards the exit. When I reached the door, I pressed my hands on the cold metal bar, praying an alarm wouldn't go off. I clenched my fist as I pushed into it, preparing to run for my life, until the door didn't open. I scrunched my eyebrows as I repeatedly pushed it, in realization that it was locked. Why would they lock an emergency exit? I thought, fear beginning to grow inside of me. I turned back again, finding myself at square one. My only other options were the staircase or the elevator. I wrapped my hands around the corner, peeking my head out. It was clear, so I slid around and went for it. Suddenly, a muffled conversation caught my ear. I stopped in my tracks, trying to locate the source of the sound. I noticed two silhouettes through the curtain of a room window. I stayed quiet and froze as I listened in. Are you trying to make it obvious? A man berated. I I'm sorry. You asked for tears or screams. I, I did my best. A woman apologized. One fucking tear that you saved for yourself. Humans aren't dumb. We can't have another escapee. We can't afford another cover-up. Get your shit together. He hissed through his teeth. Humans. Odd word choice. Uh, look, we could just move her to the basement early. I'm, I'm sorry. I wasn't trying to make her suspicious. She suggested. The basement? You want to move her early? Do it yourself. You're the one who wanted to deal with her anyway. Go fucking prove yourself or something, he demanded, his footsteps storming off. I didn't know the context of this conversation, and I didn't want to. It just gave me more of a reason to get out as soon as possible. I crouch walked towards the elevator, pressing the button. I sat impatiently as I waited for it to arrive at my floor. After sitting there for a few seconds, it seemed like I was on a higher floor than I realized. Suddenly, clicking heels walked towards the door. My neck twisted around, eyeing the door to the room. The elevator wasn't coming any faster, and I couldn't take chances. I quietly sprinted back down the hall, clenching my teeth as I heard the elevator doors open. How convenient. I turned the corner, pressed my back against the wall. I could hear the door suddenly open. The nurse stepped out. I cautiously peered around the corner attempting to see her position. She stood, staring at the open elevator, a needle in hand. I swiftly retracted my head as she looked down the hall, a look of suspicion in her eye. She began walking down the hall towards my empty bed. I sidestepped farther across the wall, praying she wouldn't see me. She walked through the doorway, stopping my breath for a moment so I did not alert her. She approached my bed, raising the needle as she slowly lifted the blanket. I lightly jolted as she realized I wasn't there, throwing the blanket back down in frustration. Little bitch, she scoffed under her breath. She's going to start looking for me. I needed a plan, fast. There was a high chance she'd end up seeing me anyways, so I'd have to trust my legs to carry me to freedom. I slowly went for the elevator. My sight locked on her as she threw curtains out of the way, desperately searching for me. As I turned the corner, she whipped around. Both of our eyes widened as our gazes crossed. We froze for a moment, as if she was scared as well. In the mere seconds of the pause, I realized I wasn't going to make it to the elevator. I then realized I was going to enter another fight for my life. I broke into a sprint, bolting past her. She unfroze, running right on my tail. As I ran, I realized the hall was short, so I was either going to have to dodge her extensively or kill her. The decision was quickly made for me as she leapt onto my back. Unable to handle the weight, I tumbled into a metal cabinet, crashing into the floor. I groaned in pain as we wrestled on the floor. She raised her arm, trying to inject me with the needle. I blocked it as she swung down, 
my arm shaking as I held back her force. She gripped her other hand around my arm, pinning it to the ground. We were in a face-to-face -face struggle, her hot breath hitting me. Her skin was beating red, her mouth stretched open to reveal inhumanly jagged teeth. I wriggled the arm she held down, attempting to release her grip. Just fucking sleep, she growled, forcing the needle towards me. Groans tried to escape through my teeth as the needle almost grazed my skin. I tugged at my arm with all my might, lifting it off the ground with her grip still attached. I directed her arm towards my mouth, quickly sinking my teeth into her skin. She craned her head back, her screams of agony growing stronger as I bit harder. She dropped the needle, using her other arm to pull herself from my grip. As blood began pooling in my mouth, I realized. She gripped her arm, staring at the wound as she whimpered. Blood oozed out of the tooth-sized holes, dripping down her arm. While she was distracted, I snatched the needle and swiftly pierced it into her eyeball. She stumbled backwards, breathlessly crying. The needle was stuck in deep, moving around with her eyeball. She lifted her trembling arm, gripping the needle. She moaned in pain as she slowly removed it, blood trailing down her cheek. After removing it entirely, she dropped it to the ground, her bitten arm dangling at her side. She looked at me, her eyeball red. She wiped away the streak of blood, baring her teeth. She stormed towards me, ready to kill me with her bare hands. I scrambled across the ground, trying to get back on my feet. As I crawled, my hand pressed against cold metal. I looked down, noticing a scalpel under my palm. I gripped it tightly, whipping around with a slash. I hit a bullseye, slicing across her hand as she reached for me. She yelped as she retracted her hand, blood dripping onto the floor. I stumbled till I stood, planting my feet into the ground. I raised the scalpel at her, my hand shaking. Our eyes met, daggers in her gaze, but a sharper one in my hand. She wagged her hand, shaking the blood off as she came after me. She swung at my hand in an attempt to disarm me. I leaned backwards, pressing my arms against my chest to keep them out of her distance. Open for an attack, I lunged towards her, pulling the scalpel into her neck. Her eyes shot open as the blade hit a weak spot. Blood exploded out like a geyser within seconds of pulling out the blade. She tried to keep her balance, blood leaking between her fingers as she tried to plug the hole with her palm. Within seconds, she collapsed to the ground. I dropped the scalpel, my lungs on fire. Suddenly, as I watched the blood pool around her corpse, she began to change. Her skin darkened to a deep red, her hair disintegrated. Her jaw lowered as it made room to fit long, razor-sharp teeth. I scanned her corpse up and down in confusion. It had made a full transformation. Oh, what the fuck are you? I whispered to myself, my eyebrows scrunched. I tiptoed around her corpse, unable to take my eyes off of it. I reached the elevator again, pressing the button. I looked over at the door, remembering that the doctor or whatever he is, was still there. My teeth chattered as I waited anxiously, staring at the glowing button. I periodically looked behind me, waiting for him to burst out the door. My anxieties cooled down as the elevator beeped, the doors sliding open. I stepped in, pressing the first floor button. Suddenly, I heard the sound of a door opening. I looked up, noticing the doctor staring right back at me. My eyes shot open as I began to press the closed door button. Stop, he demanded, running towards me as the doors began to close. Close, close, fucking close, I begged as I rapidly pressed the button. I clenched my limbs as he just failed to reach me, his fists slamming against the closed doors. I breathed deeply, a pit in my stomach. I felt barely safe for a moment as I traveled between floors, until it came to a halted stop. I looked up at the floor number. I had stopped at the second. Close enough. I waited until the elevator doors opened. My guard raised up again as the opening doors revealed a concerning scene. I slowly stepped out under flickering lights, blood streaks running across the floor. 
I tilted my head, eyeing down the hall. Papers were scattered around, bedpans and other equipment scattered about. It felt like I walked into the aftermath of something. I stepped back into the elevator, pressing the floor button a few times. It screeched as it tried to move, but ultimately stayed stuck. I remembered the staircase next to it. I gripped the door handle, grunting as I tugged on it. I groaned in frustration. It was locked. Fuck, I muttered under my breath, stepping back into the hallway. I had to find another staircase. Before I continued down the hall, I caught something out of the corner of my eye. A fire axe sat in a glass container on the wall. I slid my arm into my shirt and elbowed the glass. It shattered easily, almost thin as paper. I reached past the shards, lifting the axe off its stand. I felt its weight in my hand, gripping it with my other one as well. I didn't know if I'd need it, but it wouldn't hurt to have it on me. I prowled down the hall, my feet sticking to dried blood. Broken lights hung down from the ceiling as the others flickered. More blood painted across the floors and walls. There had to have been a full-on massacre. When I reached the end of the hall, I peered around both corners. More empty beds lined the wall. A few of the blankets stained with blood. I hid behind the wall as I noticed something at the end of the hallway. A man was leaning over behind a curtain, grabbing something. He straightened his back, revealing a body in his hands. The person was injured, but they didn't appear to be dead. I flipped my back against the wall as he began walking towards me. I lifted the axe, gripping the handle tightly with both hands. I kept my ears open for the sound of his footsteps, the floor vibrating as he grew closer. When I felt he was close enough, I appeared from behind the corner, throwing my whole body into the swing of my axe. My eyes darted around in confusion as the blade hit the wall. The man had vanished. Suddenly, a chill crawled up my spine as fingers slowly wrapped around my shoulder. I whipped around with a swing, feeling like I was going insane as there was nobody standing in front of me. Where do you think you're going? A gravelly voice whispered in my ear. I spun around, swinging the axe throughout the air. I felt taps on my shoulders as he laughed sinisterly, making me twist and turn. I couldn't tell if he was extremely fast or just invisible. I then felt something slice across my arm. I yelped in pain as I looked down, blood seeping into one of those jagged slashes that ran across my skin. I swiftly bent my neck as I felt a stream of air fly by my ear. I swung my axe around again, still not getting a hit. I quickly pressed my hand against my cheeks as he attacked my face. I removed my hand, blood trailing through the crevices of my palm. I made one last attempt at an attack. I pressed the bottom of the handle against my stomach. The blade extended outwards. I began spinning in a circle, covering any ground that he could have been on. I stopped shortly as my lungs began to singe with exhaustion. Where the fuck could he be? Then, it clicked. I slowly looked up. My eyes widened at the sight of the man latched to the ceiling. His skin was pale. His long nails hooked into the panels. His body was facing the ceiling his skin on his neck straining as he had twisted around to stare at me. Before I could make a move, he retracted his claws and dropped above me. I screamed as the weight of his body crashed me to the ground, the axe slipping from my grip and sliding across the floor. I groaned as I held his arms back, his claws desperately trying to reach me. I stared deeply into his eyes, his iris a dark red. I slid my hands up to his arms until I could easily grab his claws. I clumped them together into my grip, bending them backwards. He hissed in pain as I pushed farther, until they snapped in half. He leapt off of me, pressing his arms against his chest like a T-Rex. I scrambled to my feet, rushing over to grab the axe. I stood steadily, staring him down with the axe raised. He stared back, stretching out his fingers with now destroyed claws. And then, as I closed my eyes to blink... He vanished as I reopened them. I looked up at the ceiling, and he hadn't gone there either. Come on, I groaned in frustration. 
I realized he had somehow snuck behind me as his arm wrapped around my neck. My eyes shot open as he applied enough pressure to cut off my airways. I attempted to reach behind me, trying to snatch him or gouge his eye, but he used his other hand to hold my arm down, squeezing my throat harder. My throat croaked as I desperately tried to breathe, and then I realized he stupidly forgot to apprehend the arm that had a weapon. With the strength of one arm, I swung the axe behind me. He shrieked in agony as he released me from his grip. I fell to my knees, coughing up saliva as my throat opened up, trying to take in deep breaths. I wiped spit off of my lips, lifting myself off the ground. He stumbled into the wall, the axe stuck in his face. I rushed him, ripping the axe out of his face. I earned more screams from him as blood squirted onto my face, a deep gash running across his forehead. Taking away his chance to escape again, I flipped the axe around to the other blade and swung at one end of his stomach. He let out groans of pain as he gripped his gut, blood soaking through his clothes. I gripped the handle tighter, baring my teeth as I tore the blade across his stomach, then retracting it as I hit the other end. Blood poured out of his body like a waterfall as he fell to his knees. Organs began to slip out of the deep laceration. His skin painted red as he desperately tried to shove them back in with weak hands. I stood over him, my chest lifting as I breathed. He looked at me as I raised the axe, his dark pupils shrieking. I roared as I swung it down onto his head. The blade sliced through his head like a wooden log, splitting it into two as it reached his mouth. I yanked the axe out, blood shooting onto my shirt. The two halves of his axe wobbled around as he fell over, his exposed organs hitting the ground with a wet slap. I watched as his corpse transformed like the nurse, his hair decayed away and his skin faded to grey. I kneeled down, observing his corpse. Are you some kind of demon or monster? I questioned aloud, as if he'd answer. I stood up sucking air through my teeth as I wiped blood off my cheek, the cut stinging. I looked down at my arm, blood dripping onto the floor from the cut. I reached for the corpse's clothes, tearing off a strand of his thin white coat. I wrapped it around my arm as a makeshift bandage, blood quickly soaking through. I searched down the hall for another staircase, my eyebrows raised as one caught my eye. I ran over, grabbing the knob excitedly and my face fell as I realized it was locked as well. Oh, fucking hell! I exclaimed in frustration, slamming my fist against the window of the door. I aimlessly walked around, absolutely stumped. All the staircases were locked. It was as if they didn't want anybody descending any further. Are they hiding something? What's the motive? Left with nothing else, I decided to try the elevator again. The doors were still open, so... I stepped back in and pressed the first floor button again. Nothing happened. I pressed it again and again and again. I was about to break it. Come on, fucking work! I exclaimed, pounding the button with my fist. Suddenly, the speakers let out a small ding. My head perked up, noticing the doors slowly closing. I stepped back, a satisfied smile on my face. The elevator jolted down a bit but stayed stuck. I looked down, my blood beginning to boil. Suddenly, I lost my balance as the elevator began to drop. I stumbled to the wall, holding the metal bar as the elevator screeched. Everything shook as I descended at full speed, until it crashed at the bottom floor. I groaned as I fell to the ground. I looked up at the floor number, but the light had broken. It wasn't hard to guess that I had hit the basement. I stood up, dropped the axe, and forced my fingers between the elevator doors. I grunted as I used all my strength to force them open, barely able to get it to separate by an inch. I let go taking deep breaths. Then, a light bulb lit above my head. 
I lifted the axe and jammed the blade between the doors. I pushed against the handle, the metal creaking as it separated. I pushed harder, trying to make enough space to fit my hand through. Suddenly, the blade snapped off the wood, clanking to the ground. I quickly shoved my hand between the doors to stop it from closing. I dropped the handle, using both hands to pry the door open. When they were successfully open, I picked up the handle and the blade. There was no way of reattaching them. It was useless as a weapon. I tossed them in the corner of the elevator and stepped into the basement. I wrapped my goosebump-ridden arms across myself, the temperature dropping quickly. The basement was dark and bleak, the walls and floors a gray stone, weak lights illuminating the hall. I slowly continued on, my bare feet slapping against the cold floors. I peered around the corner at the end of the hall. It was vastly empty, rusted pipes that clanked as heat pumped through them lined across the walls. I turned the corner, observing a few different rooms as I walked past. Most of them were unhelpful to me. Things like the janitor's closet or plumbing, rooms that rang with sounds of steam. None of them were a staircase or an elevator, so they were useless. Till I reached the end of the hall and found a room that wasn't like the others. I stepped in front of it as strange sounds caught my ear. There were two big green doors, screw holes where a sign once was. I hesitantly pressed my ear against the door. The sounds were unrecognizable, possibly plumbing sounds. What was more concerning was what sounded like human grumbling. Disturbed, I pulled away from the door, looking down at the paint-chipped doorknob. I was too curious, so I reached for it, slowly turning it. I opened the door to just a crack, peeking inside. It was hard to get a good look, so I continued to open the door frame. When it was fully open, my jaw crashed to the ground. I couldn't process what I was seeing. About a dozen people hung from the ceiling, their hands and feet stretched out and tied to hooks. Some of them were presumably doctors, wearing white coats, others seeming to be patients, wearing hospital gowns. Ventilation masks covered their mouths, appearing to be pumping oxygen. The dangling tubes were attached to tall, thin steel tanks. I slowly approached the tanks, my wide eyes locked on the person it was attached to. They appeared to be unconscious. I looked down at the tank, detaching the tube from it. I hesitantly gripped the knob, slowly turning it. Suddenly, a jolt ran through my body as an ear-piercing sound exploded from the tank. I quickly sealed it again, reattaching the tube, my ears ringing. That was not oxygen. It sounded like a scream. I looked up, slapped my hand against my mouth to hold in a shout as I crossed gazes with the person. They stared at me, fear in their eyes. What happened to you? I whispered as I removed the hand from my mouth. He tried to speak, but was unable to, letting out panicked groans. Then I noticed something I hadn't seen before. Rubber cups were attached under his eyes, sewn to his skin. Clear tubes ran from the cups to the ground, the end of them sitting in a glass jar. I knelt down, leaning close to see inside. There was a bit of water inside. It didn't make any sense. I looked back up at the cup, then back down at the jar, trying to make the connection. Then my head jerked up as I realized. They were collecting tears. I thought about the nurse wiping away my tears and then licking it off her finger. Why are they collecting tears? I stood up, observing the rest of the people. They were all connected to tanks and jars, too. I slowly stepped back, trying to take in the room at its full scale. I blinked rapidly, still trying to understand what I was looking at. I yelped as I suddenly bumped into something, whipping around at the sound of glass clinking together. I had hit a shelf. Glass jars and bottles clumped together. I lifted a jar, a piece of tape stuck to it. Tears was written across it. They seemed to be storing them. I slid them around, grabbing a bottle. I ran my fingers over the label as it read, Fear. I twisted the cap off, almost dropping the bottle as a scream suddenly rang out. I whipped around to see if anyone else was down here with me. Confused, I turned back around 
and grabbed another bottle with the same label. Again, a disturbing scream was let out as I twisted the cap off. Are they bottling screams? How is that even possible? I looked over at the tanks, everything making more sense while getting even more confusing. It's not oxygen in the tanks, it's screams. I shifted around a few more bottles, reading labels like laughter and anger and other emotions. I didn't know why, but they managed to contain human emotions. And what were they using them for? My train of thought was cut off as the people began to groan. I turned around, realizing that they had all woken up. They wriggled around, screaming under their masks as they knocked jars over, their eyes locked on me. My eyes shifted around to each of them. I wanted to help, but I didn't know how. Suddenly, loud footsteps began to echo from down the hall. I quickly slid into the corner, bunching up into a ball and praying whoever it was would go away. Of course, nothing was ever easy, as I heard them getting closer, but the people wouldn't stop wriggling around. They wanted my help so desperately. I felt guilty, but I was left with no choice. I held my breath, pressing my knees against my chest as someone walked in. The people stopped moving at the sight of her presence. Calm down. You're making a mess for nothing. She berated them. She stood a few jars up, menacingly walking in front of them. She randomly stopped in front of one of them, caressing her finger across their face. What makes you think this was going to work? She asked in a childish, condescending tone. Their bulging eyes turned to me. She took notice of this. Have you seen a ghost or something? She asked, turning around. We locked eyes, my body paralyzed with pins and needles. Within a second, she came lunging at me. I impulsively grabbed a bottle off the shelf, smashed it against her head before she could reach me. The glass shattered, a deafening scream bursting from the bottle. She stumbled around, plugging her ears as blood trickled down her forehead. I ran out the door, pushing myself off the wall as I fell into it. I flew down the hall, my heartbeat in sync with my pounding footsteps. I hooked around the corner, almost crashing to the ground. I passed the elevator and found the staircase that she had to have come from. I tugged on the doorknob, on the brink of crying as it was locked. I noticed under the knob was a keyhole. I then realized she probably had the keys that I'd have to remove from her corpse when I murdered her. The basement had nothing to defend myself, so... I'd have to get creative. I peered around the corner, watching as she limped out of the room, a bottle in her hand. She stood in the middle of the hall, twisting the cap off the bottle. She quickly shoved the neck of the bottle into her mouth, a scream puffing up her cheeks as it ran in her throat. She swallowed the scream, beginning to breathe heavily. Then I realized, they're not just storing human emotions, they're consuming them. I observed from behind the wall as she growled with each breath, her skin slowly turning red and her irises glowing. And finally, dark, goat-like horns began to erect from her head, stopping as they curled. I felt like I was trapped with an enraged bull. She began storming down the hall, her feet practically about to crack the ground. Unable to hide, I needed to find something to fight. I looked around filled with hopelessness by the emptiness, until I noticed a hanging pipe, water dripping out the end. I quickly ran out in her line of sight, latching onto the pipe as I tried to break it off. She came barreling towards me as I pulled harder. When she was too close for comfort, I snapped the pipe off and swung it at her. I smashed the side of her head, leaving me shocked as the pipe bounced off her head, the metal vibrating. She stood unharmed, her head had dented the pipe, it was like hitting a boulder. She yanked the pipe from my grip, swiftly swinging it at my head instead. I tumbled into the wall as my ear rang, blood instantly dripping down my face. My head pounded as I tried to see straight. Before I could even try and stand up, she wrapped her hand around my neck. She had the grip of a gorilla as she lifted me off the ground, about to crunch my throat. I grabbed at her arm as she hung me in the air, saliva bubbling through my teeth. Her eyes were ignited as they stared at me. Then, she tossed me across the hall, 
I fell through the air until I crashed to the ground, feeling like my ribs cracked on impact. With no time to stay down, I lifted myself with the last drops of adrenaline I had left and began stumbling down the hall. I desperately searched for a room to hide in as she stayed on my tail. I threw the janitor's closet door open, quickly throwing myself in and slamming the door shut. She immediately began tugging at the knob after I twisted the lock, stepping backwards, pressing my back against the shelf, knocking over bottles of cleaning supplies. She then began hitting the door repeatedly. I needed to find a weapon, fast. If she had the strength to bend a metal pipe, she had the strength to break down a door. I searched the room in panic, throwing around mops and bottles. I looked behind me, the door about to cave in. I needed to use what I had to my advantage. I grabbed a bottle of bleach, shaking it to see how much was left. It was about half full. I quickly twisted the cap off, my hand trembling. The door came crashing down, wood chips flying across the small room. She shoved it out of the way, preparing to lunge at me. I whipped around and tossed bleach at her face. She shrieked in agony as it doused her eyes, spazzing as she grabbed at her face. She stumbled backwards, practically clawing at her eyes. I rushed over, ready to attack. As she removed her hands from her face, I plunged my fingers into her eyes. She wailed even louder as she tried to pull my arms away. I shoved my thumbs in farther swirling them around her eye sockets until her eyeballs turned to mush. She dropped to her knees, letting out blood-curdling cries as blood streamed down her cheeks like tears. She swung her arms around aimlessly, her eyes entirely demolished. I wiped off my thumbs against my pants, covered in blood and chunks of flesh. I then wrapped my hands around one of her horns and began to pull. Her shrieks grew louder and louder as the horn began to detach from her skin. Strings of flesh splitting like melted bubblegum. With one last tug, I tore the horn off, earning a scream from her that was worth trapping in a bottle. Blood squirted from her head as she let out breathless cries. I tilted my head as I observed the horn, rubbing my fingers against its grooves. I looked down at her, realizing she wasn't over with. I held the horn like a knife, aiming at her gaping mouth that continued to let out sounds of agony. I pierced the horn through her mouth, her face dropping as blood began pooling in her mouth and trickling past her lips. She fully dropped to the ground, blood gurgling in her throat. I pressed my back against the wall, slowly sliding to the ground. I just needed a moment to breathe. My side throbbed as I sat. The pipe had done good damage. I leaned my head back, wetting my dry eyes as I blinked slowly. I enjoyed breathing slowly for once. How do I always get myself into these situations? I chuckled to myself. Satisfied with my short break, I stood up, groaning as my sore ribs ached. I flipped her corpse over, digging through her pockets until I found the keys. They jingled as I lifted them, dropping them in my pocket. As I was about to walk towards the staircase, I remembered the people. I couldn't just leave them. I went back to the room their eyes lighting up with excitement at the sight of me. One by one, I unhooked them, helping them onto the ground. Thank you, thank you, a woman cried as she shook my hand, her whole body shaking. I had no idea what to say, so I just nodded. Before I led them to the staircase, I snatched a bottle of anger from the shelf and shoved it in my pocket. They seemed to be as good as grenades. I then left the room, the people followed behind me, they seemed to be stuck here for a long time, their legs weak like jelly. I unlocked the staircase, opening the door for them. Go, quickly, and call the police, I ordered, motioning for them to run. They squeezed through the door, desperate to escape. They ran up the stairs like a stampede, and were out of my sight quickly. I followed suit, my wounds throbbing as I limped up the stairs. I finally reached the first floor as I pushed open the door. I stepped into the main lobby, seeing rows of waiting chairs in the front desk. I made my way into the lobby and realized the exit was to my left. Except a man was standing in front of the glass doors. I froze in silence as I watched the man stare out the doors, the prisoners running in the distance. What have you done? His voice shook, bawling his fists as if he sensed my presence. It was the doctor that almost caught me earlier. 
He slowly turned around, the veins in his face bulging. His eyes were pure black, like staring into a void. You'll pay for this, he growled, his voice demonic. I ran away from sweet freedom as he came stomping towards me. I zigzagged around the hall as I pulled on every doorknob, being left with nothing but locked doors. I was so close, I couldn't die now. When I found an unlocked door, I threw it open and leapt inside. I slammed the door behind me, locking it quickly. I had entered an operating room, medical machinery standing around and a blue table in the middle. I began throwing open drawers, looking for any type of weapon. After finding useless things like stethoscopes, I snatched a bone saw. I almost jumped out of my skin as he began pounding on the door. I turned around, watching as it bounced on its hinges. I crept towards the door, facing my back against it as I got close. I slowly reached for the lock, twisting it to unlock the door. He tried to throw it open, but it was blocked by my body. He shoved his hand through the crack, trying to grab at me. That was my cue, as I threw my back against the door, loosing it on his wrist. He roared in pain from behind the door as he began kicking it, his trapped hand wriggling around. I reached over with the bone saw, pressing the blade against his wrist. He screamed in agony, rapidly kicking the door harder as I began to slice his hand off. The blade easily cut through his skin and muscle, blood squirting and dripping down the door. His hand began to slump as I hit his bone, blood pouring onto the floor. I gripped the saw with two hands as I cut through thick bone. He tried desperately to pull his hand out, but I kept enough pressure to keep it stuck. When I cut through his bone, I sliced through the rest of his skin, completely amputating his hand. It plopped into the pool of blood on the ground, white bone poking out of the stringy meat. Blood squirted out of his nub as he removed it from the door, my body pressure shutting it. I quickly locked it again, his wails ringing from behind the door. He was going to continue coming after me, and I wouldn't be able to pull off another stunt like that again. I then remembered the bottle that I stored in my pocket. I pulled it off, twisting it around in my grip. I thought of the ways I could use it in my advantage, but none of them would kill him, until an idea popped up in my head that would either save my life or get me killed. I twisted the cap off, quickly shoving the bottle into my mouth. The sensation of the scream filling my mouth was indescribable. I could hear it in my ears. I squeezed my eyes closed as I somehow swallowed it. I stood for a moment waiting for its effects to kick in. For a moment I was confused, as I felt completely fine, until my body began to feel hot. My limbs twitched as my skin grew hotter, the blood running through my veins feeling like magma. In mere seconds, I felt like I could split the earth in half with the stomp of my foot. I marched towards the door, my body feeling weighted. I threw the door open, the knob banging against the wall. The doctor stood, his back facing me as he whimpered, his hand wrapped around his bleeding nub. I rushed up behind him, dropping my foot into the back of his leg. He grunted as he dropped to his knees, holding himself up with one hand. I cracked him over the head with my heel, knocking him flat on the floor. He groaned in pain as I planted my left foot on his back and my right on the bicep of his good arm. I reached down and began pulling his arm back. He choked out screams as his bone began to crack felt like a fire had ignited within me, harboring pure rage. I gave it one last tug and snapped his arm. He tried to kick his legs into my back as he cried. Blood gushed out of his arm, jagged bone tearing through his skin. I stepped off of him, planting my feet at each of his sides. He groaned through his hyperventilating as I balled his hair up in my fist, lifting his head. Please don't do this. My people need your resources. He begged through his agony. I ignored his pleas and pressed the blade against his threat. It felt like bombs were exploding in my chest, my muscles straining. I began rapidly easing back and forth at his throat. He gargled out screams as blood sprayed across the floor. I bared my teeth, my eyes wide open as I pumped hot air out through my teeth. I let out a roar as I sliced faster, his stringy flesh tearing apart. With one last slash, I decapitated him. I raised his severed head up, blood dripping onto his body. My chest pumped as my lungs inflated with air, 
my heart feeling like a firework. Then, I crashed. The rage in my body plummeted, leaving me feeling exhausted. I dropped the bone saw in the head, blood spurting out as it rolled across the floor. I stumbled off his body, my limbs feeling weighted. I trekked down the hall on the brink of fainting. When I neared the doors, I dropped to my knees. My muscles couldn't handle any more. My vision blurring, but I was so close. I had to keep moving. I moaned as I stood up, dragging myself towards the door. I shoved the door open, leaning on it so I didn't fall. I took in a deep breath of the soothing air, closing my eyes. I did it. Again. I then looked up as the sound of sirens in the distance caught my attention. I was filled with hope for once as three cop cars skidded into the parking lot. One of the officers hopped out of his car, rushing over to help me. I fell into his arms as he walked towards his car. You're okay. You're okay. He reassured me. He opened the car door, helping me in. I settled into the leather seat as he slammed the door shut. I watched in a daze as he sat in the driver's seat, speaking white noise into his handheld radio. I dissociated as I stared at the bars that separated the front and the back seats, feeling lightheaded. I said, what's your name? He suddenly asked, breaking me out of my trance. Maria, I answered, my throat dry. Okay, Maria. We got a call from a group of people claiming they were medical workers that were imprisoned and some crazy things about demons. They claimed you freed them. Is that true? He questioned slowly. I looked up at him in silence as I tried to get my thoughts together. I... yes, I did, I answered. All right. Don't worry, you're not in trouble. We're just going to take you back to the station to get you patched up and... Then you'll have to go through questioning, he explained. I nodded weakly, rubbing my eyes. He started the car, and we began driving back to the station. The car ride was peaceful, a rare moment where I wasn't fighting for my life. I watched as the buildings flashed by in a blur, the clouds moving slowly. I couldn't believe it was finally over. I could breathe. I felt safe. Do you have any family we can contact? He suddenly asked. I turned to him, thinking of a way to answer that question. Family? I I killed my entire family. I thought about my mom's side of the family, people I hadn't spoke to in years. Would they even remember me? Or Or take me in? Well, here's to hoping they aren't cannibals or demons. I met Lily in the strangest of ways. Looking back, I can see that it was somehow fitting that my first interaction with her took place just three days before Halloween. She had always had some spooky sense about her, which is part of what led to my attraction. I was visiting a haunted house with my then-girlfriend, Emily. It wasn't just any haunted house, but one of the best, if not the best, in Ohio. Several of my close friends were actors there, so it made things even more fun for me. I made it my personal challenge to get them to break character, but it happened only a few times. It was a great opportunity for them, though, as I was willing to play along. Actors were not allowed to make physical contact with the guests, but they knew that they could get away with it with me. So it added to the scare factor when other customers saw me getting grabbed and pulled into the action. I had given Emily advance warning, but it still gave her some screams. Emily spent most of the time with her arms wrapped tightly around me, but we had entered a tight corridor and were forced to walk through single file. She still grasped my hand with a ferocity you couldn't imagine. Without warning, someone grabbed my wrist and pulled my hand out of hers. I felt myself getting pulled back and was thrust up against a wall in a dark corner. I could feel someone's breath close to my face. Hey, not cool. I shouldn't leave Emily. Before I could finish my sentence, I felt her forcing her lips against mine. I couldn't see her, but I knew that it was not my girlfriend. Emily was tall, about five foot ten, and whomever was kissing me was much shorter. 
I felt embarrassed to admit it, but it was the best kiss I had had in my life, and it was from a stranger. She pulled away and then came close to me again. This time, I reciprocated, and after a few seconds that seemed to last forever, she pulled away again, this time biting my lip in the process. Hard. It drew blood. Then she left, just like that. The best glimpse I got of her was from behind, petite as I suspected, and wearing a short baby doll dress. I noticed her flowery scent also. She skipped away into the darkness, and in a sing-song little voice she said, Happy Halloween. I stood there for, well, I don't even know how long. It was long enough, though, that I was unable to catch up with Emily until we were both at the house's exit. She seemed understandably perturbed, but upon seeing my bleeding lip, a concerned look crossed her face. Oh, baby, what happened? Nothing, I said. Nothing. I mean, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm fine. But I wasn't fine. That girl, that kiss, it was all I could think of for the rest of the night and the following day. I thought that it must have been a silly prank, or maybe even someone that I knew, and it meant nothing. Still, I simply could not get it out of my head. It did mean something to me, and I had to know who it was. If it was someone that I knew, a friend, uh, that might be awkward. But if it was a stranger, I needed to meet her. I mean, at the core of my being, I knew I needed to meet her. A couple of days later, I mentioned the encounter to my friend, Jacob. He was an actor at the house, and said that he hadn't heard anything about it. He asked around to see if anyone had been trying to play around with me, but no one admitted it. There were a couple of new girls in the cast, but neither fit my description, as vague as it was. There was a cast party planned for Halloween night, after the house closed for the evening. Given my acquaintance with many of the actors, he said it would be fine for me to attend as a guest. He suggested that I should, and perhaps my mystery woman would come forward. I accepted his invitation on the spot, not needing any time to mull it over. I had become a slave to my emotions. The night of the party arrived. I begged off with Emily, saying that I was under the weather. I couldn't very well tell her to party with me. That would sort of defeat the purpose. Everyone was coming to the party in character, and even most guests had decided to arrive in costume. I decided to go as a guy who didn't care, and simply wore jeans and a button-down shirt. I wanted her to recognize me. If she was even going to be there, I told myself. Well, it turned out that she was not there. At least, not that I was able to see. No one there fit even the vaguest proportions of the girl. I couldn't smell her perfume. I felt dejected, to say the least. I stayed for hors d'oeuvres and a couple of drinks, then told Jacob and a few friends that I was going to head home. They begged me to stay a little longer, but I had seen what I had come to see. Or, rather, did not see who I had come to see. I asked directions to the bathroom so that I could take care of business before I left. Jacob pointed me towards a dark hallway at the back of the banquet room and said that it was the last door down. It's difficult to describe how I felt, but anyone who had been in love and gotten hurt knows the feeling. The knots in your stomach, the tightness in your chest. After washing my hands, I headed back up the hall, but as I passed a set of double doors on the left, I heard a voice, a girl's voice, softly singing a haunting melody. It was a voice, I thought. I hoped that I recognized. I backed up and slowly pushed the door open, stepping inside. A storage room of some sort. It was quiet, aside from the singing, and dimly lit. All dark with a few pools of light under the bare bulbs spaced around the room. The singing stopped, and I called out. Hello? Hello. Then she... Yes, I knew it was her. She stepped into one of the pool lights. There was no doubt in my mind. Aside from the scent of lilies, she was as petite as I had remembered, 
and seems to be wearing the same baby doll dress. Only now, I could see that the beautiful girl I had imagined met all my expectations. Her skin was utterly white and as smooth as porcelain. Her eyes seemed overly large. She had the most amazing eyes. I was reminded of glittering emeralds. She had an upturned pixie nose, and her face was framed by curls escaping from a head of fiery red hair that had been pulled up into a bun. She was breathtaking. She introduced herself as Lily, an apt name, for more than the fact that she smelled like the flower. Someday I would find it ironic that the Lily of the Valley is, despite its beauty, decidedly poisonous. I would be remiss if I did not mention the fate of my relationship with my girlfriend, Emily. I am ashamed now to say that once Lily and I began seeing each other on a regular basis, I dropped Emily like dead weight, not giving a second thought for her feelings. That was so untypical of me. At the time, though, my heart and mind were faithfully focused on Lily. Lily and I quickly became friends, and then lovers. I was completely devoted to her, even though I did not know whether she shared the same feelings for me. It was difficult to imagine that she didn't, as we eventually began to spend every waking moment together. Eventually, Lily ended up staying the night. I woke up before her the next morning, and once the blurriness cleared from my eyes, I glanced over at her. The sheets had been tossed aside, and the sunshine fluttered in through the curtains played on her naked back. Something confused me. I got out of bed and threw open the curtains, allowing the full morning sunlight into the room. To my horror, I saw that Lily's alabaster skin was covered with bruises. There were the most appalling discolorations all around her lower back and belly, and even along the tops of her thighs. It had been dark, but I was quite sure that they were not there the previous evening. I shook her awake, softly prodding her so as not to cause her any pain. Lily, I whispered, then louder. Lily. She came awake with a start, eyes barely opened. She rolled over to face me. Good morning, she yawned, then blushed. She pulled the sheets up to cover her nakedness. Oh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I... Sorry for what? I suppose that I was a little forward last night. It's very unlike me. But for some reason, well, I feel something special with you. I shared her feelings and wished that I could have taken the time to tell her, but I was too concerned with what I had seen. Lily, your bruises, you're covered with them. Did I do that? Oh, I'm so sorry. She pulled the sheets aside and examined herself. That's odd. No, they don't hurt. I can barely feel them. I'm sure that you didn't cause them. I think that I just have delicate skin. Delicate skin? I didn't think that explained it at all. Every time I attempted to bring it back up, she deflected the issue and changed the conversation. I eventually gave up, thinking that I was causing her embarrassment. By the time I saw her again, the bruises had miraculously healed. I suppose that she recovered as quickly as she bruised. Perhaps she was right. Perhaps she just had a certain problem with that. Uh, perhaps everyone bruised to some degree, and her pastel complexion just made it more obvious. Still, it was disturbing. I tried to be careful, but I noticed it often as we spent more time together. Once, I pulled her towards me playfully, and purple blooms appeared on her arm in the shape of my fingers. The lightest touch seemed to cause her flesh to bruise. Yet, she did not complain a whit. I tried to push aside my thoughts concerning her problem. Aside from that, she was the perfect woman. She was beautiful, but acted as if she did not know it. She was controllable, yet capricious. An accomplished courtesan who acted like a virgin. As a lover, she was insatiable, and astounded me with her intensity of interest when in bed. And yet, after a time... Our lovemaking would leave me with a certain distasteful feeling. 
She seemed cold inside, like cool, wet meat. Then there was the bruising. She always seemed renewed after a while, though. A bruising gone, smelling of lilies, and as soft and warm as a lamb. The closest I had come to finding out the truth under, well, better circumstances, had been during a conversation over beers with my friend, Jacob. I had explained to him that Lily was the girl I had told him about. He looked at me in an odd way, but continued our conversation in a light-hearted tone. So, Lily, huh? He arched his eyebrows. Yeah, I said. I met her that night in the house, and then again at the party. And that was it for me. She had me wrapped around her finger ever since. Jacob stared into his beer, a smirk on his face, nodding. Yep, yeah, she's a quiet one, isn't she? I laughed. <laughs> at first, yes, but... Since she came out of her shell, she's the most passionate lover I've ever been with. Wait, so, uh, you... Jacob set his beer on the bar. Every night. He sat there, assessing me, his jaw hanging open for an awkward amount of time. I couldn't tell what he was thinking, but his change in attitude concerned me. Then a huge smile cracked his face, and he busted into hysterical laughter. Oh, God, he wagged his finger at me. You had me going for a second. Half the time I can't tell if you're being serious. <laughs> scary, man, scary. I made a couple of jokes and then turned the conversation away from Lily. I suppose that I didn't want to know any more. I thought that maybe he knew something about her that I didn't. And that made me feel uh, jealousy. Uh, angry. I'm not entirely sure what the feeling was, but I didn't like it, and so never brought up the topic of Lily again. The problem was that Lily was getting sicker and sicker as time went on. In addition to the bruising, she began having, I suppose, that spells is the best word for it. I would find her doubled over, clutching her stomach and moaning, obviously in great pain. She would always say that she'd be fine, though. She would always say that she would be fine, though. Uh, they give it some time. And she was always fine, uh, within a day or two, seeming like nothing ever happened. I would have thought that she was experiencing psychosomatic symptoms, or perhaps faking it for attention. But there was the smell. Uh, during these spells, her usual flowery scents would be pervaded by something rotten. It was hard to be near her at times like those. I knew that it was those times she needed my support the most, but I felt too weak to handle it. She seemed resigned to it, though, and so I couldn't convince her to see a doctor. Well, as a matter of fact, she did say that she was seeing someone. I gathered that he wasn't a medical doctor, per se, but more of a holistic healer. Just as I was about to give up, at my wit's end, the truth came out. The awful truth. I had stopped to meet Jacob and a few of his friends for dinner after work. I tried to avoid the subject of Lily, as usual, but somehow things always circled back around to her. It was as if Jacob and his friends were fascinated by her, by my relationship with her. So, uh, Jacob turns to me, smiling. How are things going between you and Lily? His friends snickered. Well, uh, okay, I suppose. He came in close to me, close enough that I could smell the sour beer on his breath. Now, really, he gave an exaggerated wink. How are things going, hmm? Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. Everyone chuckled again. The anger was growing in me. I could feel my face turning red. Enough, man. Lily and I are fine, and a story. For some reason, Jacob and his friends thought that it was hilarious and burst into laughter. I shook my head in frustration, downed the dregs of beer in my glass, and excused myself. I needed to use the men's room, I said, but planned on sneaking out the door afterward. I was done with this sort of talk. I stood at the urinal, finishing up, 
when Jacob's friend Jim walked into the men's room and took up a place at the urinal beside me. For a few seconds, he stared at the wall ahead of him while he relieved himself, and then began talking. I thought he was just rambling on to himself, but soon realized that he was addressing me. So, you been, uh, he heemed. You been taking Lily home with you, is that right? My eyes narrowed. I was suspicious and entered the conversation cautiously. Yeah, uh, taking her home with me might not be the right way to say it, but yeah, she and I have been spending a lot of time together. Ah, uh, yeah. Lily is, uh, unfortunate, I suppose. Real popular with the boys. What the hell is that supposed to mean? I yelled, maybe a bit too loudly for a public restroom. He kept talking calmly as he zipped up and washed his hands. Nothing. But please don't misunderstand me. You and Lily have something special, I can tell. And if anyone can understand her, it's me. What? Just be careful. She always comes crawling back to me in the end, and I hate to see her get hurt. When I arrived home that night, Lily was nowhere to be found. I tried calling her, but received no answer. I really wanted to talk to her. My interest was piqued, but at the same time, I was afraid to know what the hell Jim was going on about. Was Jim her lover? Did they have some type of understanding? Was he just a friend who knew about something going on? Something bad? Or did he know something regarding Lily's illness? That might be the worst thing of all. First, that she would confide in him, and not me. And second, it made me wonder if it was that bad. A thousand thoughts raced through my head. It took two glasses of whiskey to get myself to sleep that night. I finally passed out, phone in hand, with Lily's number on speed dial. It was a harsh morning. I had had way too much to drink the previous night, and combined with my anxiety over Lily, I was nauseous. I downed a cup of coffee, took a shower, vomited, and took another shower. I wanted to crawl back in bed, but I needed to know. Suffice to say that I became wary of what I said to Lily. I tried to coax information out of her, information about Jim, but I was trying not to be too obvious. Her answers were always cryptic. I'm embarrassed to say that I started checking up on her. I'd follow her to see where she was going after she left my place. She spent so many hours working at the house that I'd always picked her up there after her shift. Apparently, even in the off-season, there was plenty of work to do around a haunted house attraction, preparing a new scary experience for the coming year. Lily usually left before morning and I had never given thought to where she was going or how she got there. What I did know, and was beginning to weave together, was that Jim also spent a lot of time at the house. He was sort of the master makeup artist for the house, and had been responsible for developing some of their unique props and special effects. There was a reason that I was considered the best horror house in Ohio, and Jim played a large part. My paranoia finally came to a climax, and one night, after an evening of lovemaking, Lily quietly slipped out of bed to get dressed. I faked a deep sleep so that I wouldn't interrupt her. She kissed me on the forehead, softly, and quietly exited through the front door. No sooner than hearing the lock on the door click into place, I was out of bed and at the window. I saw Lily, standing at the curb and talking on her phone. After a few moments had passed, a car pulled up and she got in. As they pulled away, they passed under a street lamp, and the driver's face was illuminated. I felt a cold lump in my stomach when I realized who it was. It was Jim. The way I saw it was that I had three choices. I could pretend that nothing was wrong and continue seeing Lily as if I knew nothing. That would be the easiest and most pleasant choice if it weren't for the horrible heartache I was feeling. I could just stop seeing her altogether. I'm sure that she would figure out the reason and she would either be angry or indifferent. And my third choice was to confront them. 
although I knew that it would gain me nothing but the scorn of Lily, and most likely ostracism from Jacob and his actor friends. It also seems to be the most satisfying option. I wanted, no, I needed to see the looks on their faces when I caught them. After giving them a short head start, I jumped into my car and sped off, catching them about two streets down and then dropping a few car lengths behind them. It had started drizzling, and with the light flaring through the raindrops, it was difficult to see. Unless they suspected that they were being followed, they would never know. We drove around for about ten minutes, and finally ended up back at the haunted house. So this is where they met. How tawdry. How sickening that Jim would stoop so low as to refuse to take her back to his own apartment, or hers for that matter. I felt a twinge in my chest when I realized that I, in fact, didn't even know where she lived. I saw them walk in. I waited in my car. Five minutes. Ten minutes. Should I have just given up and gone home? No. Thirty minutes had passed before I scoured up the courage to approach the rear door of the house. I entered a shadowy hallway. Once my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I realized that I was in the same hall as the storage room that I had met Lily in that night at the cast party. I noticed lights coming from under the double doors, and the sound of a radio playing Metallica. Not exactly mood music for two lovers, I suppose, but I already knew this was no normal relationship. I stepped up to the doors and put my ear to the crack. I could hear Jim's voice, humming and singing along with the music, but hearing nothing from Lily. I knew that she was there, though. I could smell her perfume the telltale scent of flowers, and stronger than ever. My throat was dry, my eyes burning, and I realized that I hadn't taken a breath in what seemed like ages. My lungs were burning. Finally, I burst through the doorway. I suppose that I wasn't as intimidating as I had imagined myself to be. Jim acted as if he had barely noticed me come in. He just looked up from his work, said hi, and lowered his eyes to the table again. His work. Lily lay on the table, split open from breast to groin, where one would expect to find blood and entrails. There was only a slush of thick, purple juices. There was something that seems to resemble bones, but they were strangely jointed together, with grisly wires and metal rods. Heaving and rippling bags of soaked cloth approximated the position of where her stomach and guts should have been. Lily's beautiful face was an eerie caricature of her normal self. Her mouth hung open, tongue lolled to one side, eyes staring at the ceiling. I thought that she was dead. Killed by this maniac. But then I half realized that she had never been alive. Or was she? I was so confused. One of her eyes rolled my way and focused on me. I knew that she could see me, but she did not speak. I could swear that I saw some sort of embarrassment there in her distorted face. Please, I gasped as my legs went out from under me. Please, explain. I had passed out. As I started to come around, I saw Jim leaning over me. He was kneeling next to me and splashed water on my face. He helped me sit up before encouraging me to remain on the floor. He also took up a position on the floor opposite, cross-legged, and stared at me. After a moment of silence passed between us, he said, This isn't what it looks like. I exploded. Isn't what it looks like? What the hell does it look like? What in the holy hell is going on? Well, you see, I originally uh, created Lily as an attraction for the haunted house. I had good ideas before, but I could tell right there from the start that she was going to be exceptional. And she was. A big hit right from the beginning. I debuted her about three years ago on Halloween evening. Unlike my human actors... You could do anything with her, or to her. Nail her hand to a wall, pluck her eye out, 
cut off an arm or a leg. I'm still impressed by how well my experiment turned out. However, even when she didn't undergo any vicious maiming in the name of art, she still became ill every week or so. I could never figure out why, but each time that I revitalized her, I added in a little extra, uh, something to make her more human. What you see today is the result of years of fine-tuning. I felt sick to my stomach. So, what is she then? A robot? Oh, no, no. And nothing so simple. Then what? An automaton. A biological organism. Something inanimate. Something alive. At some point, I really lost track. Maybe even. And I could tell that he wasn't joking around. Uh, maybe a little bit of magic. The point is moot, however. Because now she's sentient. That's ridiculous. You tell me. What do you feel when you're with her? When you conversed with her? When you kissed her? When you were intimate with... Stop it! I screamed. She... I mean, it is an abomination. For the love of God, man. How can you keep this up? She should have been destroyed years ago. For the love of all things holy, please end it. Jim was silent for a moment. It looked like his eyes were tearing up. And he quietly said, No. I stood and walked out. I would end up going back to settle things later. But at this time, I was overloaded with emotions. Fast forward to today. I've put all of this behind me. After the fiasco that was my relationship with Lily, I couldn't stand to face my friends anymore. I am married now, have a great job, a nice house, and I've moved very far away from Ohio. I have not spoken to Jacob or any of my other friends from back in those days. I stay away from Facebook or any other form of social media because I'm afraid that someone will look me up. I don't want to have that conversation. I do keep in touch with Jim, though. Uh, he evidently perfected his creation and eliminated the need for revitalization treatments. He went on to great success and works in Hollywood now. He even has his own studio. In fact, I just got off the phone with Jim a short while ago. I guess that's what brought all these memories flooding to the surface. We arranged a visit, and my lovely wife and I will be flying to California next week, where he has invited us to stay at his estate. We will be spending quite a bit of time with Jim over the next several months. You see, Lily is pregnant. We sped northbound on Route 6, coming up to Ash Springs, with the glittering open sewer called Vegas well behind us. The mountains lining the horizon brought dragon teeth to mind, as if the Mojave itself were sitting upon an immense dragon's tongue. Goldie was laying across the back seat, staring dispassionately at the wingless fly that pranced around her forefinger. She'd been toying with the bug since she'd caught it at the last truck stop. She'd pulled off the critter's wings while I was in the restroom, busy packing my left nostril with crank. The crank helped keep my dread and terror in check, at least somewhat. I dreaded and feared what she might one day do to me. I dreaded and feared witnessing her next feast. But most of all, I dreaded and feared that the day was coming when she would seek the affections of another. She barely looked a day past eighteen, though I knew she was much, much older. Her hair was a deep shade of gold, like sunlight filtered through honey. Her shirt rode up her belly and revealed the ruby-red tattoo above her navel, two trillion diamonds coming together for a kiss. Eyes on the road, Goldie said, without looking up from the insect dancing around her knuckles. I focused on the black tarp stretching out before me, 
shimmering with heat under the sun's unyielding gaze. Goldie hardly ever spoke, except when necessary. I'd been with her for years now, and we'd never had anything approximating a proper conversation. Suddenly, she sat upright in her seat. Get ready to pull over, she said, then absentmindedly popped the fly into her mouth and swallowed it. Up on the shoulder of the road, there was a large sign advertising a truck stop diner out on Route 318. There, she said, and I rolled the car toward the shoulder. Just behind the sand-scorched diner sign, I heard the distinct sound of a police radio squawking. A speed trap, no doubt. Stay here, she said, and hopped out. Her miniskirt danced in the wind as she bopped along the road, barefoot. Heedless of the sizzling blacktop under her feet, she disappeared behind the sign. I could imagine the cop's, aw shucks, ain't this my lucky day grin as I heard him say, Why well, hey there, little lady. I lit a marble red and crushed another line of crank on the dashboard. It wasn't long before I heard the cop shrieking and the useless pop, pop, pop of his service weapon going off. I looked up over the dash as I finished cutting the line just in time to see the unlucky officer as he ran off, blood gushing from the ragged stump that had been his member. We locked eyes for just a moment, and I saw the disbelief and terror etched across the tattered remnants of his face. He made it about six feet towards the road, when she pierced his chest and lifted him off the ground. He grabbed at the sharp tip of the black chitinous spear that punched through his sternum right before she pulled him towards her hungry maw. I met Goldie almost ten years ago on a North Vegas sidewalk, shortly after I snuck off a mark I met at the poker tables. I'd been desperate and dope-sick, and he promised to supply me with a gram of black tar in exchange for my services. When I finished and demanded the payments, I got a left hook to the side of my head instead. He dumped me onto the street, then took off. I was on my hands and knees, spitting up mucus and blood and four of my back teeth, when I saw her, sitting on the curb, with her porcelain thighs curled up to her chest. She smiled. I've been waiting for you, she said. Her pale blue eyes flashed silver, and the next thing I knew, we were in the back seat of a stolen sedan. She looked detached as she slid her fingers inside the slick gash between my legs, regarding me the way she did as she toyed with that fly on her finger. My withdrawal symptoms vanished faster than they would have with a methadone hit or even a shot of boiling tar into my veins. I loved her from the start. How could I not, even when she first revealed herself to me and fed upon a hapless trucker just outside of Bunkerville? I loved her. Whether or not Goldie felt the same way about me, I simply didn't know. Her touch was gentle and her kiss was soft, but her eyes lacked any semblance of warmth. The emotions that she did show rang hollow, as if they were practiced. From then on, I drove and she'd recline in the back seat, only deciding to speak when she'd tell me when to make a turn or cut off the highway and drive straight into the desert. I never asked any questions as we drove into collapsing concentric circles around the Mojave like water swirling into a drain. Though our routine varied, we always ended up at the same patch of sand at the foot of Spirit Mountain. There was a black cave mountain in the southern mountainside, like a dark eye staring out at the desert. Goldie would leave me then, disappearing into the cave for days at a time. I couldn't bring myself to stare into that black eye for more than a second without turning away, shivering despite the heat. Goldie never said what was inside that cave, and I didn't ask. When she'd re-emerge, we'd drive again, prowling the Mojave in search of sustenance. The days bled together, then the months. Goldie paid for gas, and when she felt like it, food for me. She never ran short on money, 
When she decided that she wanted to drive for days on end without stopping, she provided the crank to keep me awake. Though, I'd never seen her actually purchase the stuff. It was all one big cycle, just like our rotating patterns around that hole at the foot of Spirit Mountain. Yet, as those long years stretched onward, I began to suspect that our time together would soon end. I'd started noticing a suitable shift in the way Goldie regarded me. Her gaze, which had been growing silver more often, tended to linger a little longer than before, almost the way she did when she was spying her prey. However, my growing concerns did nothing to diminish my love for her. In fact, one could say those concerns only bolstered my devotion. Even if she was indeed incapable of true emotion, her touch was all the love I needed. She'd cured my addiction and shielded me in this wretched world. She was my queen, and I was happy to remain her loyal cupbearer, come what may. Her name wasn't really Goldie. That was just what I called her, though never out loud. I didn't think she had a name, save for the private ones my predecessors whispered to themselves. There was no mention of her in any native legends or early American ghost stories, either. I suspected anyone who ever looked upon her bare form had either loved her or became her meal. She emerged from behind the diner sign. Her mouth was smeared red. She curled her forefinger, beckoning to me, and I went to her. Goldie stripped me naked, then lay me down in the red slick of gravel beside the idling squad car and had her way with me. I stared down at her blood-smeared lips as she kissed me between my thighs, and it looked as though she was eating me alive. Every time she touched me, she felt more and more ancient, as if to touch her skin was to touch the fabric of time itself. I pictured her nesting under the mountain where it was buried under sheets of ice, under oceans, within the burning molten landscape at the dawn of time. I imagined the first time she ever emerged from that cave to snatch the unfortunate Navajo scout who made the mistake of waking the Queen of Spiders. When she finished with me, as I lay quivering at her feet, her dispassionate eyes suddenly flashed silver. She gave me that strange look again, and for the briefest moment, I was certain that she was going to devour me. I didn't fear that possibility as much as I should have. Having her fangs sink into my mortal flesh was certainly preferable to her simply casting me aside to suffer this world without her. But she didn't bear her fangs. She only kissed me on the cheek as her eyes faded from silver back to pale blue. She licked her lips clean, then went back to the car, and I scampered after her, naked clutching my discarded clothes to my chest. She told me to drive northbound. I pulled back onto the road and continued our journey. For the next two days, we drove non-stop. The meth became a layer of shattered glass, masking my exhaustion, but even in that fog, I noticed something different about Goldie. She was in the back seats, as usual, but I felt her eyes locked on me as we made our rounds, circling the dragon's tongue. I kept waiting for her to instruct me to cut into the desert, to begin our way back to the cave at Spirit Mountain, but she asked me a question instead. What do you want to do after I'm finished with you? Goldie asked. It wasn't the question itself that shocked me, but that she asked at all. Unless I'd forgotten, this must have been the first time she'd asked me a question since the night we met. My crank-addled brain struggled for an answer. Well, I don't ever want you to finish with me, I said. Her sad smile took me aback, as it was easily the most genuine emotion I'd ever seen her display. You were my favorite, she said. Then she lay back down on the seat, smiling to herself, and with my heart filled with dread, because were indicated the past tense. 
The steering wheel became a slick mess from my clammy palms as I considered the implications of Goldie's words. I pictured her with another woman, and the jealousy drove me mad. Yet, I hated myself for harboring this envy, for being so petulant by comparing my mortal concerns to the desires of the Spider Queen, the eternal dread shadow of the Mojave. When you do finish with me, I said, without taking my eyes off the road, I hope you'll bless me by filling my belly with your babies. I'd trade my soul for you to lay your silken sacks in the hollowed-out caverns of my body, my beloved queen, so that I can serve you one last time before my dying breath. I glimpsed the rearview mirror. The setting sun was low and shadows danced over us, and I could just barely make out the gentle curvature of Goldie's pretty pink lips. I'd driven her down this road a hundred times during our countless roundabout trips. Less than a mile ahead, the lurid establishment burned a garish shade of neon pink that sizzled in the desert night. The closer we got, the more that toxic, cold, cathode gas discharge seemed to taunt me. Stop up here, Goldie said, which didn't surprise me in the slightest. Minutes later, we sat in the brothel's main parlor. I was smoking a cigarette and sinking into the plush velvet sofa with Goldie beside me as the girls filed in. Goldie studied the woman with her slate-colored eyes. Not one of them was a day over twenty-five, each one clad in sinful leather and lace. One young woman in particular stood out. Her scant red lace attire contrasted with her cherubic face and the innocent brown eyes. She was quite beautiful, I'll admit, and Goldie seemed to think so too. My spider queen drank in the young woman's slender mocha frame before she turned to me and smiled. What do you think of that one? She whispered. I shrugged. Cigarette smoke trailed from my nostrils and, once more, I pictured this hard country, brothel and all, sitting upon that dragon's tongue, and how I wouldn't be the least bit saddened if the beast suddenly snapped its jaws shut. She's pretty, I finally said. Look closer, Goldie responded. Despite my growing anger and jealousy, I turned a begrudging eye toward the mocha woman. Somehow, now I saw it. Beneath her well-practiced concubine's smirk, I got the unmistakable sense that something within this young woman was broken, just like I'd been when Goldie first found me. Though she lacked the track marks that had pockmarked my veins, it was nevertheless evidence that her seductive smile was no more than a thin mask concealing some shattered innocence within. I wonder... What brought the Mocha woman here, to this life? She was running from something, just like I'd been. Perhaps, in this world, some women were simply destined to trade flesh for dope or money, and the reasons didn't ever really matter. Goldie hadn't uttered a single word, yet the Mocha woman approached us. Her practiced smirk had faded. Her wide brown eyes were brimming with innocence and helplessness and love. Like mine had been when Goldie found me, desperate and spilling blood onto the sidewalk. Goldie completed the transaction, and we followed the mocha woman down a dark hallway. Goldie's eyes were glued to the woman's gently swaying hips, those red lace stockings that came halfway up the young woman's caramel thighs. The room was dimly lit, and there was a heart-shaped bed, so red it looked like it had just been cut out of someone's chest. The mocha woman curled up on the bed and waited for us with her chin tucked into her ample chest. A nubile maid so beautiful that it stung to look upon her. Still, as Goldie stalked around the bed, ogling the mocha woman, my jealousy smoldered and burned and threatened to turn to hellfire. 
My successor may very well have been no more than just another broken young woman forced to trade her flesh for her livelihood. I no longer suffered the guilt I felt when I previously harbored such jealousy. It had been different then, when my replacement was simply hypothetical. But here, up close, the only thing that kept me from slashing her throat was the mere fact that I lacked a piece of shattered glass. But then, Goldie returns to my side. She lifted her right hand, and her two upraised fingers fused and blackened and curved. The dim lamplight danced across the black exoskeletal dagger as she snapped it off her hand and offered it to me. Do what you think is best, she said to me. She kissed my cheek. It's up to you. Then she drifted into the dark corner of the room and her arachnid shadow fell across the heart-shaped bed. The mocha woman simply lay there, her abiding devotion to our queen already so complete that she didn't even flinch when I pressed that shittenous dagger against her neck. Yet, before I could open her throat, I realized those smoldering embers of jealousy had flickered out. Now, no more than harmless wisps of smoke. I looked down at the mocha woman and recognized what I saw in those submissive brown eyes. She loved me, just as she loved our queen. As I held the dagger against her carotid artery, I felt her meager, mortal pulse reverberate through the blade and realized what Goldie had done. I placed the dagger on the side table and climbed atop the mocha woman. I toyed with her as Goldie had toyed with me. I made her scream as Goldie had made me scream. And... At the precise moments I brought her to climax, I caught my reflection in a mirror on the wall and spotted my eyes flashing silver. The tires kicked up plumes of dust in our wake as the mocha woman navigated the sedan towards the black eye in the mountain. Goldie lay on the back seat with me on top of her, resting my face upon the twin ruby diamonds above her navel while she ran her fingers through my hair. Dawn broke, and the sun was a fireball rising up from the dragon's throat as the mocha woman pulled up to the cave mouth. She cut the engine, and the cooling mechanism ticked like a hand on a clock. It's time, Goldie said. We left the mocha girl in the car, and I followed my queen into the mountain's depths. The dark confines were claustrophobic, as we transversed the twisting honeycombed tunnels. If not for Goldie's hand squeezing around my fingers, I'd doubtlessly wander these halls forever, lost and blind. We passed through one final antechamber before stepping inside a massive, hollowed-out dome. Above us, bioluminescent creatures shriveled and shrieked at our approach their tiny, writhing forms giving the impression of starshine. I closed my eyes and inhaled the smell of clay and soil and rock and tasted echoes of primordial soup on my tongue. Beside me, Goldie shared her mortal artifice to bear herself to me. She loomed high over me, supported on her long, spindly legs. Her eyes dazzled as she clicked her fangs, and I ran my fingers down her smooth pedipalps. I dropped to my knees in both worship and love, and crawled beside her rounded abdomen to kiss those ruby diamonds one last time. I love you, I told her. I remained on my knees as she rapidly worked her rear legs in unison with her spinnerets weaving layer upon layer of spider-spun silk around me. Before long, she'd finished layering my chrysalis, and she left me to my rebirth, snug in my cocoon, and already I could feel the change, my skin hardening with protein and chitin, and the hunger slowly growing a gnawing urge to satiate. It was weeks before I was reborn, I'm something else now, 
not quite spinning the infinite web like Goldie had done, but something else. Now, I'm a spider with human skin. I go about my day among the flies, catching them in my web periodically, and I'm sitting here, typing this now, after a particularly delicious meal. However, I'm alone, very alone. And each night I pray that I'll see my spider queen again, if only to thank her for this gift. Come on, Mackie. What's stopping you? Brad spoke to me over the phone. You're single? Your career's kicking off? You got a good reputation around the block? I mean, if you ask me, I think you're more than capable of leading not only the storyboards, but concept designs, too. I know I can do it, I replied, fiddling with my keys to try and open my apartment door, while at the same time trying to talk to Brad. Just give me some time to think about it, at least. Is that okay? I finally got the key in the lock and let myself in. Yeah, man. Of course. Brad said. I'll let you sleep on it, and I'll wait for you to tell me tomorrow that you're up to the challenge. I chuckled at his confidence. Mm-hmm. I responded. Well, thank you again. As always, I'll give you a firm answer tomorrow. All right, brother. You take care. You too. Night. I hung up the phone, threw my stuff onto my bed, followed by myself staring at the ceiling. I'd just been given the opportunity by the studio to serve as a leading consultant for storyboard and concept art on the new cartoon the network was producing. Did it finally pay off? All those years of interning, studying, drawing, and scribbling during class as a kid and not even paying attention. Guess so. In truth, I was being a little overly humble and modest over the phone to Brad, the art director for the project. Of course I could do it. I knew that without a doubt. Uh, but I also didn't favor making such fast decisions. I wasn't going to be able to sleep easily the whole night. My mind would be racing. I stepped into my art studio, surrounded by the many colorful designs plastered on the walls. They were creations over the years from when I was young, some recent, some I'd made on road trips when I was bored, some during study hall in school, and countless more I don't remember exactly when I made them. Sitting on my drawing board was an unfinished project I'd started last night, but didn't get around to completing and probably won't anytime soon. It only possessed a head and shoulders, and not even hair or eyes. I don't really know what it was supposed to be. A character, an object, an animal. Who knows? That's how my imagination worked. I just sort of draw whatever comes to mind and go with it. One of the pieces hung on my wall was my first drawing. Well, first complete drawing, I should add. At least, that's what my mom said it was. And looking back to it, she always knew I would have a natural talent for art. I was four, I believe, and she said it was the best drawing she'd seen from any four-year-old. Any mother would think that of their child, of course, but my friends and other relatives said the same. It was a drawing of what I could only describe as perhaps a hybrid between a cute little bunny and a tiger cub. It had the features of a bunny, but the fur pattern of orange with black stripes. I like to think that was due to me watching Winnie the Pooh around that time and having a special liking to Tigger. It was the only explanation I could think of, uh, but as I was viewing it, I spotted a rather minuscule but distractingly odd detail I just noticed. Near the bottom right corner of the paper was a small black speck. Why was that odd? On a piece of paper over twenty years old, in which wear and tear were bound to occur? Well, You'd be amazed at how well kept this drawing was after such time had passed. The paper was never that dusty or dirty, yet for some reason I was just now noticing this one little detail left behind. A little spot. It was too perfect, too intentional. 
Oh, sure. I just put it there myself when I first drew it as a child. Yeah, that was the probable explanation. Kids do weird things like that sometimes. And maybe I just felt the need to put a little speck with my pencil or pen and left it there where no one but myself would notice. Then again, nothing else on the paper reflected black whatsoever, and it was entirely in crayon. What might have caused that? Was it believable that I had a random pencil or pen just lying around at the time? It's plausible, but why would I have done that? I kept trying to contemplate in my head what my four-year-old self might have been thinking, but how the hell would I know? I was a pretty weird kid, and it was such a distant memory. And maybe that was my way of signing my arts when I was that age. Signed here, Mecky Phillips in a black dot. That's how you knew it was me. What the hell was I doing? I had sleep to catch up on. Brad had convinced me. And by the next two days, I was sketching new ideas and designing new storyboards for the show. I was coming up with character designs, building layouts, suggesting what sort of colors and contrasts to use that might better capture the essence and tone of the series. A manly action-adventure genre with some light-hearted comedy trickled throughout. I felt at times that I was overstepping my bounds at some points, but Brad suggested that was nothing to be worried about. More ideas were better than little in his eyes. I'd finished the first draft for the lead character of the show, a minimalistic cartoon style reminiscent of Bruce Timm's illustrations. I brought my idea over to Brad for his consent, and to my pleasure, he loved it. He said he'd pitch it up to the producer as well for a final review to make sure that they too were pleased. Everything had to please them at the end of the day. Not so many audiences understood that about the business. You might make great art, but it means diddly squats if the men at the top don't see a profit out of it. I was just wrapping up for the day and was getting ready to leave the studio when Brad came by to talk to me. Hey, Key, Brad called to me. That was my nickname, Key. Uh, hey, I said back. So, uh, bad news and some good news. Uh, all right. Want me to give you the good news first? I, I prefer bad news first. Cool. Well, bad news is that Larry thinks we should change the design to something more, uh, oh, how do I put it? Uh, minimal. I arched my brow. Larry was the main producer of the show. Technically, he had the final say over all creative decisions, including Brad or me. I... it already is minimalist, I argued. That's literally the form. I know, and it, trust me, man, it looks great, Brad insisted. If it were up to me, I'd definitely keep it, but unfortunately, the guys up the chain aren't 100% satisfied. Uh, say, more like 85%. They could bite me, I wanted to say. But instead, I said, All right, I, uh, I'll start thinking of some new drafts, and I'll show you them in the morning. Nah, don't lose any sleep over it. We'll work on it through the weekend and next week. Sound good? I nodded. Good. Uh, hey, man, sorry again to be the bearer of bad news. It's nothing personal. It's not an attack on you as an artist. It's just they want something just a little more par with what their version for the show is. I gave the fakest reply possibly in my entire life. I completely understand, I said with a smile. It's nothing. And, oh, yeah, uh, what was the good news? Brad looked thrown off for a bit, but then regained his thought. Oh, uh, the good news, he said. Well, uh, you get to try again. He gave a cheeky sort of smile that for the first time since knowing him, I had a tempting urge, similar to a bad itch, that I could knock those perfect white teeth out of his face. That night, I got home and did the opposite of what Brad said and stayed up working on different sketches and ideas for new designs for the character. What was wrong with mine? 
I thought it was a timeless animation design and easy on the eyes. Not only that, but from a creative perspective, it worked for the show. I knew exactly what they wanted, too. Some boggled down, simplistic Carl Arts design carbon copy that had been done many times before. I figured it was time to try something unique and fresh once again, while simultaneously being a callback to the old animation myself and other genres before me grew up on. Appreciation for effort seems to be dead these days. It was an hour past midnight now, and I didn't leave my drawing board for hours. I didn't get up to use the bathroom, I get a glass of water, or anything. But whilst drowning myself in my work, I did peek over again at my first drawing posted on the wall to my left, and I noticed something that made me squint to make sure my eyes weren't deceiving me. I got up to go over and check for a closer look, and my eyes saw just fine. The dot I'd seen in the bottom right corner of the paper was in a different position this time. It had moved upwards and more towards the left side of the page. Again, I was tired, this time for my own will, but I couldn't have been that exhausted to see that I was completely right. And another thing I observed, but perhaps was also tripping over due to my lack of sleep. The spot was slightly bigger this time, and more akin to a filled circle. At first, it was as if someone planted a single dab with their pen, whereas here it was more of a jot and two little rotations with the ball. The next afternoon during lunch, I showed Brad what I'd come up with for the new character designs. I showed him four different alternatives for what we might use. I watched his face change from wide-eyed, amused, confused, and bemused in one sitting. I think this one will do, he said, pointing to the first one. It was the most simplistic of the drawings, and, in my opinion, my most uninspired piece. Of course, he'd pick that one. Uh, what about this one? I pointed out another. This one has more emphasis on his facial expression, and gives him a bit more emotion, uh, you know? Yeah, but we can't have the characters stand too far out from each other, Brad said. The difference in colors will be what distinguishes them in this case. But character designs were so much more than just color. Expressions of the face told a thousand words about who the person or thing was that you were drawing. Nevertheless, I agreed with him, though not in my best interest. Gazing later that night at the other drafts I'd whipped up sitting on my drawing board in my room, I sighed with pity at the wasted time and threw them in the trash can. Whilst doing so, I glanced over at my old drawing again to see where the mysterious dot might have ended up this time. I had almost forgotten about it earlier in the day, possibly due to how ridiculous of an assumption it was to assume a dot could magically change places across a piece of paper. I discovered that it was in the same position I last found it. However, something was unusual yet again. Getting a closer look, I found that it seemed not only bigger, but... I could almost swear it was beginning to appear more than just a measly spot, and an entirely different shape instead. But it was too small to see with my naked eye. I took a magnifying glass from my desk and placed it a good distance between my eye and the paper. I squinted with my rights to get a good look at what I was seeing. It didn't make sense. It was a shape. A shape of some sort of figure. A person I could have sworn. It was a black silhouette of a humanoid shape, and it looked to be an amazing detail for it to be so shrimpy. I just knew that if I could somehow put a microscope over it, I could get a completely detailed and intricate picture. It was so strange. It hadn't been a dot after all. It was a vivid picture. But how? I couldn't have drawn that as a kid. Not at that age. Even for an adult, or any skilled artist, it was practically impossible. It was unimaginably impressive to draw something of that detail and that size. I tried to see what sort of expression or stance the figure was doing, though with close inspection, 
it didn't seem to be doing much at all. It sort of just stood there, and it was just a shadow where I couldn't see any sort of emotion on its face whatsoever. However, the more I stared at it, the more I noticed it began to unsettle me. It was so out there, so far-fetched for it to even exist right there on the paper. And the question still bugged me. How did it even get there in the first place? The next day, I was off, and I decided to call my mom. I knew she'd probably have a picture of it somewhere in her photo albums. How's the new job going? She asked me over the phone, excitedly. It's going, I told her. How's the blood pressure? Oh, I'm keeping it at a good level right now. Doctors say to eat less red meat, so I've been working on that. You must be struggling. It's not as bad as I thought it would be. There's days I'll still want a burger here and there, but there's plenty of other good things to cook that don't have all that junk in it. Yeah, but then there's using too much butter and seasoning, knowing you. Exactly. I then changed the subject. Hey, um, do you remember my first drawing? I shot the question. Well, I remember a lot of your drawings. She replied. Your first drawing? Uh, yeah, uh, the one I took with me. Uh, it used to be on the fridge all the time. Oh, the crayon-colored one. Yeah. Yes, I remember that one. What about it? Uh, I know this is random, but I was wondering if you had a picture of it anywhere in one of the photo albums or somewhere. There's a small little detail drawn on the picture that I swore wasn't there the first time I drew it. I just want to be sure, they, out of curiosity, you know. I may have it somewhere. Hold on. She and I talked a bit more while she looked around through the photo books for the old drawing. She knew she'd taken a picture of it somewhere. That's what she told herself, at least. She usually did with these kinds of things, just in case they ever got lost. My mother was also from the generation where photos weren't exactly scarce, but also held with more value, which captured special memories and moments to last a lifetime, compared to nowadays, where it's easier than ever to take a photo, giving less need and maybe wants for a photo album. It was a good trip down memory lane for her, as she would make warm-hearted comments and exclaims of joy, as she told me all the old photos. She'd turn the page over and find whether they were baby pictures of me and my siblings or old family vacation trips when Dad was still around. Eventually, she struck gold. Well, what do you know? She said. I found it. Wow, I replied. I'm actually surprised it was that easy. That's what I keep telling you from the start. Getting a photo album so you can have these memories kept forever. And you can keep one for all your drawings, too. I do have one for all my drawings. I'm not talking about a portfolio, but like an actual photo book. So you can show your kids and my grandkids one day. If I have kids... Give me some hope, won't you? I'll send you the picture. Thanks, Mom. You're welcome, baby. When she did send it, I paid close attention to the detail in the photo she'd sent, compared to the one on the wall. Everything was practically the same, except for one thing. The silhouette wasn't drawn on the photo my mom sent. It was only on the actual copy. So I was right. I didn't actually draw that. I knew I couldn't have. Then that begs the question, who did? I decided to check up on a camera one night to check and make sure no one was breaking in. It was a cheap studio apartment, and I didn't have the money and consent with my landlord just yet to install ADT or some alternative. Crazy enough, the thought of someone breaking into my apartment just to add an elaborate illusion was hilarious by itself, but still no less creepy. What would be the reason? Just a harmless prank from one of the guys at the studio? I couldn't think of who, and I couldn't imagine going through the trouble of trying to pull something like that off, 
let alone risking a criminal offense for trespassing. Even still, the impossible and precise detail of the figure didn't seem realistic from a measly creep in the night. That next day, I looked at the drawing to find that the silhouettes appeared slightly bigger than last time. Now it was starting to get quite unsettling. I had to review the footage, but what I saw led me nowhere. No one broke in. Nothing changed on the paper on camera. Everything remained unchanged. For whatever reason, what was seen through the lens didn't reflect what I was seeing in reality. A couple of months had passed, and by the end of the pre-production, I had finalized most of the concepts and storyboards, and the characters were, for the most part, set on their final designs. Or rather, as final as final can get. The voice actors who needed to record their lines and the eventual pilots would still need to be screened, of course, for review, so we could get a consensus on what does and doesn't work with the show. But for now, all else was nearly wrapped up. I hadn't noticed a change in the silhouette since that night I checked the footage. I just accepted that it would be a permanent mark on my first drawing ever. While it bothered me a little, at least my mother had the original copy saved in our family photos. I've gotten home again, and walked into my studio room, and nearly jumped at the sight on the wall. The silhouette was no longer miniature, but now grown in size, taking up nearly a quarter of the page. The texture of the grain or ink drawn into the page bore a stark presence, almost as though it were burning into the paper. It contrasted with the bright, vibrant crayon colors aside from it, in a very morbid fashion, with a nightly black hue. I stepped over to the paper nervously, afraid of some unknown threatening aura that could be felt within the room. Getting a closer look, the silhouette was filled with the most absolute darkest of shades I'd ever seen, like staring into a black hole. But one other striking detail was now apparent that gave me chills to this day. I could discern that the figure held an actual expression on its face this time. A calm, Sinister smirk. I grabbed the paper off the wall and put it away in one of the bottom drawers in the studio room. The last thing I wanted to do was to see that thing every day I walked past it. That night I slept well up until about 2 or 3 a.m. when suddenly I thought I heard a noise from within the studio room. It sounded like tapping or lights banging against the walls or drawers. I got up from my room and crept up into the kitchen first to grab a knife, then sneaked over to the room. The door was already open. I'd have to flip the switch to see who was inside, if anyone. God, I hoped there wasn't anyone. I cautiously turned on the light to the room, the illumination straining my eyes, and then quickly scanned the area. Nobody. A sigh of relief came over me and then I suddenly felt silly for getting worked up over nothing. I then looked down at the drawer that I discarded the drawing in, glaring at it for a moment. Why not, I thought. I put the knife down on the dresser and kneeled to open the drawer, grabbing the handle. The sight of it from last time was so eerie, yet alluring, but I had already considered throwing it away ever since it became a noticeable presence so I figured I might as well do that, since it was giving me all this trouble. My hand pulled on the dresser handle, and it opened to reveal that miraculous smirk now covering the entire page, the size of an actual head staring directly into my soul. I jumped back onto the floor and froze for a bit. The eyes and the face, and my old drawing. It was gone. I couldn't even see it anymore. It had been replaced with whatever this thing was. After getting myself together, I immediately burned it with the grill outside on my balcony. Burned it to bits and discarded them over into the grass. I watched it disappear into the night, still shaking from that god-awful sight. I might as well have killed an old friend, a piece of my memories. I thought to myself, at least I had the original, though, if not the physical copy. But when I looked back at the message my mom had sent me of the picture, it was gone. It appeared as though the file had been corrupted or something, and I was unable to view it. 
I had saved it in my gallery on my phone as well right after she sent it, but still, it was nowhere in sight. Like it never existed. I tried asking my mom the next day if she could try sending it again, but to her and my surprise, the photo was ruined. Somehow, the image was blurred and awfully distorted to where it was unintelligible. She didn't spill anything on it, and nothing could have possibly tainted the photo from where she placed the album, she told me, as none of the other pictures were at all affected. There was really no way to explain it. It just sort of died. That was the only copy she had. The last living proof of it even existing. Later that day, I hung out and had a couple of drinks with some friends and a colleague from the studio, and pretty much went through a mild five stages of grief within one evening. I felt like a piece of me was now gone from losing the picture, but I knew that there were countless more creations to be made and hundreds that I did create. This was the beauty of art, I told myself in a drunken slurred speech to my buddies, that art preserves and is forever in all aspects or some sentimental speech like that. I don't really remember. I was plastered. One of our DDs took me home that night and made sure I got inside my place safely. Still inebriated, I stumbled into my room to undress, but first decided to make a trip to the studio room. I turned on the lights and looked around at the various other projects I'd made over the years, soaking in my vanity, glory, and pride. How about that, huh? I said aloud to no one. Huh? How's that? And there's more where that came from. It was my big F.U. to the silhouette and to the loss of my first accomplishment. I didn't know who I was trying to prove myself to or what, but that didn't matter. I was so out of it and couldn't even see the hangover that was about to hit me in the morning anyway. As I was turning to leave the room... I took a glimpse of one of the other drawings that put me in first place for an art contest back in fourth grade. It was a spin on Salvador Dali's Persistence of Memory, uh, you know, the one with the melting clocks. It was my favorite painting, and I decided to do one of my own, but with a warped deception to my bedroom at the time. In it, my bed was melting into the floor, the trophies and toys of my dresser liquefying bit by bit. The window pane seemed to turn flimsy. Some of the walls were even oozing. I even drew it to where you could see a bit of my bathroom door open, and some of the inside, like the mirror, sink, toilet, shower. Some of these objects were also starting to melt. And inside of the bathroom, you could even see the shape of someone hiding. A shadow. I sobered up real quick again, as fear replaced every other sensation in my body. I know for an absolute fact that I didn't draw that there. With the help of my magnifying glass again, I aimed over the bathroom door cracked open in my drawing. I watched the silhouette stare directly back at me through the mirror, with that same malevolent expression, that devilish smirk. About a year passed, and as we were wrapped up producing on the cartoon, I was offered a position as an art director for another upcoming animated series. It seemed like a dream come true in otherwise more favorable circumstances. However, I wasn't drawing like I used to. I sketched here and there, but I didn't have time anymore. I'd been managing and overseeing other artists' work, micromanaging and dictating what passes as art or not. Taking notes of that passion, that fire in their young, hungry eyes. It was like ripping a plant from its roots. By the end, there had been only one picture left in my studio, that wasn't tainted by the shadow. A self-portrait of me in an animated style. I stared at it with a cold, desolate visage. I didn't even recognize it anymore. I remember a time where I might have been proud of making something this grand, but now I don't know what to feel. It didn't mean anything to me anymore. And in the far distance of the background on the canvas, there I could glimpse the shadow waiting. With the magnifying glass zoomed in on it, it stood there, with its arms crossed, head tilted down with its dubious grin, staring at me. 
It knows. It knows good and well what it was. A malevolent force with intentions unbeknownst to me. It was no use in waiting for the shadow to take its full form and completely destroy the drawing with no remorse, as it did with the others. They'd all been lost, with no way of ever recovering them. No recollections of pictures, files, videos, nothing. All disappearing from the face of the universe. And with that, I decided to do the honor myself, and burn the last one standing. I went back to my studio room, staring at the empty walls around me. They had once been plastered with creations of grandeur, zest, creativity, and most importantly, individuality. I was twenty-eight years old and didn't even recognize who I was anymore. I no longer perceive it with my own eyes, but I just felt its presence. I knew, somewhere, looming over me from a dimension invisible to myself, that it was still watching me, glaring at me with that same mischievous, hungry smirk. I was traveling in my mom's van. The back trunk was packed with sports gear, banquet utensils, and kitchenware. I was trailing 80 kilometers down an unfinished road, though the speed limit was set higher. I had always felt uneasy traveling in places I'd never been because I had a tendency to miss a turn and get lost. The drive from the small town to the condo is only supposed to be 30 minutes, but I had been driving for 45 already and still hadn't yet reached it, nor had I seen any signs. It was a clear day on the road with a few clouds in the sky. The air was crazy hot, and my face was sweltering. I was already blasting the AC on the dash to its highest setting, and set all events pointing to my face and my pits. I didn't do well in the heat. It was not my decision to go out there at the time. My name is Weston. My family calls me Wes, or Wessie, if they want to get on my nerves. And a family reunion was the very reason for my long drive. Eventually, me, my family, my grandparents on both sides, a wide range of my cousins, aunts, and uncles would all congregate to a large and busy new condo being built out in the middle of the wilderness. One of my uncles had snatched it up right away as soon as it had been marked for sale. The turnover will be massive, was something along the lines of what he said. They were only building a few of these properties out here, as the place was previously a protected national park. Due to budget cuts, the conserved property line of the land was cut back, allowing for the sale of new infrastructure to be built around the deeper parts of the park. And who wouldn't want a beautiful, small, secluded mansion in the middle of the forest? I had been allowed to show up a few days earlier before the rest of the family arrived in order to prepare the house for them. I had most of the amenities, while my cousin, Reese, had shown up the previous day with a truckload of food. So together, we could just unpack everything, explore, and hang out by ourselves until the rest of the family arrived. This would have been the relaxing bit of vacation if it were not for the fact that I hated Reese. Reese was like the frat boy without a fraternity, the jock without a team, the gangster without a gang, the bully without a crew, a one-man band of off-key violins, kazoos, and broken bagpipes. Just an all-around pain in my neck. That, and he hit on my sister at the last family reunion. It was so awkward for everyone involved, as my sister was ignorant to his advances. She was thinking that his motives couldn't possibly be anything but innocent, because we were all cousins. The road swerved around a sharp bend, and suddenly I saw the turnoff. I slammed the brakes, and dry dust from the tires flew into the air. I looked back at the driveway and did a six-point turn on the narrow road to maneuver the van back around. I rolled into the large dirt driveway, still partially under construction. The lot was quite huge. I could see a large pile of bulldozed trees and rubble in the corner. The driveway would have definitely been big enough for some of my uncles to come. They owned large motorhomes and camper vans that were basically small homes all on their own. 
Unlike the road, the house and the yard were essentially completed. Though it was two stories high, it didn't quite peek over the trees, leaving it shaded, and still well hidden. But it was no quaint cabin in the woods, and was built modern style. I could hear a faint thumping of bass coming from the upper floor of the house. Good to know Reese had settled in. I parked and clambered out of my van, grabbing a large duffel bag of gear and started lumbering up towards the house with it. The music got louder as I entered through the door, and I started yelling for Reese. Hello? It's Wes, I shouted. I received no answer, and immediately started losing the energy to care enough for his attention. I dropped off the bag in the corner of the room and went back to the van to continue to unpack things. Miraculously, Reese appeared after bringing in the final lawn chair into the house. What's up, cuz? He raised an open bottle of beer to me. Good to see you made it. He offered a second, unopened bottle to me. I shook my head no. I don't drink, I stated. I was pretty sure he knew already. Come on, there's no one else around. The fact that I'm underage isn't the reason I don't drink. I pushed back. Ah, we'll get some liquor in you before the week's up. I groaned at the thought of him and some of my uncles tiredly pushing beer down my throat. I doubt that, but I didn't want to antagonize him more. Which one's your room? I asked. Top floor, the big suite. I claimed it for myself. First come, first serve. Great, then I'll pick the one opposite. He flipped me the bird and smiled. He then chugged the rest of his first beer and belched as he started to open the other one. I believed he was being deliberately extra immature in my presence. I made my way to the basement, which had a billiard table and a couple more rooms. I thought of playing a game, but I didn't know where the balls were and I would either play by myself or with Reese. I'd prefer a nap. I put my pack in a nice quiet room in the corner. It was almost soundproof, as I could barely hear Reese's bass thumping through the wall. I was tired, sweaty, and hungry. I changed my shirt and cursed myself for not bringing more clothes, as I didn't account for how many I would soak through. Back then, I was slightly bigger and didn't have a lot of muscle. I just got out of high school, and without gym class, I was just starting to let myself go. I went upstairs to the kitchen looking for food. The kitchen contained a lot of snacks, a freezer full of meat, some cupboards full of junk food, and a fridge full of beer. Two full of beer. There wasn't a lot of room for other food of actual substance. Who gave Reese the shopping list? I went to find him. There was a living space on the third floor, and he had already set up the gaming console to play some first-person shooter. You know there's going to be some kids at the reunion, right? What are they going to eat? I asked. Eh, don't worry about that. They got hot dogs. And cheese. He raised the controller at me. Want to play a few rounds? Nah, I'm starving. I guess I'll make some hot dogs then. Oh, me too. Thanks. And extra cheese. I didn't say anything. I knew that if I had made food just for myself, Reese probably would have claimed it from me. I retreated back downstairs and started boiling some water for the hot dogs. It was my preferred way of cooking them. I began toasting the buns and realized the oven elements and the toaster were just adding to the already sweltering temperature. I looked for the thermostats while I contemplated sweating on Reese's hot dog. I couldn't find it along the walls. However, as I was looking around, I noticed the kitchen had a large glass sliding door that faced a pool. I looked eagerly at the cover on the top, wondering if it had been filled already and if the filters were set yet. I walked over to the glass and stared longingly. There, I opened the door to notice the latch was broken. Was that a concern? I'd need to remember to tell my uncles about it. But it wasn't like we were worried about robbers in the area, just more concerned about an overly clever bear. The door slid open, and I meandered out to the edge of the cover and lifted it. Unfortunately, the pool was empty. 
I thought we should have filled it before the family got here. Though I definitely wanted a dip for myself, thinking about how cool the water would be. I looked around for the hose and stuck it in the open pool cover flap. I turned the water on full blast and watched it pour into the cement pool, noticing it was going to take a while. I ran back inside to finish making the hot dogs and then went back up the stairs to feed Reese. We actually played some video games together, each of them being a different variation of first-person shooter and each of them a different variation of ways to lose to Reese. The longer we played, the worse it got. He would annihilate me and refuse to just be on my team and play against a computer or the campaign. Eventually, I got tired of it and gave up. Reese badgered me. Ah, uh, already? You sure you don't want to try again? I think you got real close last time to taking one of my lives. I was starting to get scared. No thanks. I think I'm going to go outside and explore. I said, knowing that he would not join me. Nature wasn't his thing. Whatever. Sue yourself, Boy Scout. Reese turned back to his game. Hey, uh, I'm filling up the pool, by the way. Could you check it every once in a while? Make sure it doesn't overflow before I get back. Hey, that's a good idea. Swimsuit summer. Nice. He gave me the thumbs up. Huh, <laughs> totally. I forced a response, hoping he wasn't making any sort of reference to my sister. As I headed outside, I made the detour to check the pool before I left. The water level had risen, but not much. It felt safe to leave to go on a hike in case Reese decides to flood the place. I headed out into the wilderness, going slow and making note of the direction that I came. I eventually found a hiking trail nearby. I knew there were some in the area. They probably used to be bigger and more populated before the construction started. As I followed it down, I noticed some deer tracks. They were very obviously imprinted in the mud, but I couldn't tell how old they were. Actually, they could have been goat tracks, but I wasn't sure. The sound was deafening, and by that, I mean it sounded like you were deaf. The trees were just so thick it blocked out all of the sound or echoes. There was no breeze rustling the branches and rarely any birds tweeting. If there was any wildlife, they had other places to be, apparently. Even though I was outside, I couldn't help but to feel claustrophobic. The woods were a mix of different types of leafy trees and tall pine trees, whose leaves were alive at the top but seemed more dead at the bottom. The other trees were all thick in stumps, and there were not that many young trees. It made it feel like a very old forest. It also smelled amazing, and the shade was keeping me cool. I trotted down the trail. I was still sweating, but managed to enjoy myself. Not huffing and puffing, but still getting my exercise. The trail must have been easy at one point, but... When I was on it, the ground was covered in branches and dead leaves or debris. Like a storm had passed, but a long time ago. I guessed this was a part of the park's trail they stopped caring for after the budget cuts. There were even large rocks I had to scramble over. I couldn't tell where they had broken off and rolled from. I began fooling around as I climbed over things. I imagined I was running through an obstacle course. I'd jump off a low rock onto another rock and limbo under a branch. I would swing around trees using branches to give myself momentum. I hopped from rock to log to a dirt mound. I started huffing, but I felt like a little kid again. The trail sloped down, and instead of carefully and waywardly walking, kicking my legs behind and forcing them forward fast enough to catch my next step, just enough to stop me from somersaulting head over heels. The ground started evening out again, but I still had some speed going. I saw another odd shape, a darkly colored boulder up ahead and mentally prepared to leap over it like a show horse. My large body thumped the earth as I barreled forward, each foot hitting the ground hard, counting my steps and preparing for which foot I would step off of. I picked up my already max speed as I galloped to the black rock and jumped high like a track and field star. Wait, what the hell? 
I shouted in midair. When I landed, I almost rolled my ankle, and I stumbled due to a double take on the object. The boulder upon a closer look wasn't actually a boulder, and as I stared at it, I began to sweat harder than when I was running up rocks. It had an odd, bent shape to it, and was black leather. I immediately thought it was a delimbed body in a jacket, deformed, uh, broken, then tossed into the woods to be decomposed and forgotten. But it wasn't that. I extended my foot and poked the corner with my end of my shoe. It tipped over. A seat? I asked the inanimate object. It was, indeed, as I was examining it, a seat. It looked like an uncomfortable car seat. I first thought of a dirt bike since it was on the trail, or a quad bike, but it just didn't seem to make sense. I thought maybe there was a secret treehouse or a cabin, and this was a furniture item of that place. But that was reaching even further. Maybe something exploded and it landed here, and there's all sorts of vehicle parts all over the place. My mind continued its mental gymnastics, making up more and more impossible things to the backstory of the seat. But then, it instantly was recognizable. A seat to heavy machinery, like a backhoe, a bulldozer, or excavator. It was becoming clearer the more that I thought about it. Also, the more I looked at it, the more I convinced myself that I was right. There were these machines in the area, and there was some clearing and construction going on. It had to be, and one of the workers, seeing that it was broken, dumped it out here as garbage. Disgraceful, overpaid litterers, I thought aloud. But that didn't really make sense either. There was a dump truck for all the forest debris, and they could have just put it in there. And if they were going to dump it, why all the way out here? I bent over to touch the leather armrest and rolled it over. It was shredded on the opposite side. The seat was cut deep into its interior by what looked like a large knife, like someone slashed it a few times as an anger relief practice. As I was holding the seat at an angle to get a better look at the damage, my fingers slipped on the leather, and it rolled back over. I became aware of how sweaty I was at the time. Though shaded in the tall trees, my body was worked up over the excitement of the dashing and parkour I did along the trail. I saw that the sun had dipped a little further behind the branches and realized how much time had passed. I decided to turn back. I thought about lugging the seat back with me, but just thinking about it made me more tired and sweaty. Instead, I kicked and booted off of the trail into some ferns. Out of sight, out of mind, out of here, I said with a turn, and waltzed myself back up the trail. When I reached the house, I stopped by the pool to see how much it had filled. It was almost full, enough to swim in, but just below the deep end ladder to be difficult to pull myself out of. A little bit longer, and I could dip my feet in the cool blue liquid. I reached my hand out to feel the temperature. It was chilling, as it was just out of the cold water tap. It seemed like ice water compared to the hot summer air. I shivered with delight. I loved the cold, but I knew it was going to be a shock to my sweaty body. I figured I would wait just a little bit longer for the pump to heat it up. I went inside to change into my swimming shorts. Upstairs I heard video game music, but it was looping. I climbed up the steps and peered into the room to find Reese had passed out in a beanbag chair and the game menu was up. I thought it was a great opportunity for my own peace and quiet. I decided I was going to stay up and see the stars. I grabbed my phone and headphones, then went to find the pool lounge chairs. I set them up around the deck side and got comfy in the one farthest from the house in the shadow of a tree. Shame they couldn't leave a few more trees for shade, I thought out loud. I shifted the pool chair to add more of a recline and got comfy in it. It was one of those sort of hammock types where you feel like you're falling into it. I turned on the tunes and started playing some dumb puzzle game on my phone. We hadn't gotten internet connection out there yet but I really thought it was a conspiracy by the parents to not install it out there before the reunion, forcing us to get closer. I took a big breath and sighed, 
soaking in the precious quiet and private hours I would be able to have before the weekend started. The sun was going down behind the trees and shadows were growing. I was disappointed I wouldn't be able to see a nice sunset, but figured the stars would be worth it anyway. It would be wonderful to see them without the city light pollution. Out here, the only lights were from my phone and the window on the third floor of the house. It was the perfect night. A very fast hour went by. I noticed a change in animal sounds as I heard more crickets and other bugs. The day birds had gone to their nest, but I could swear I heard an owl. I expected to see more, but the park was so vast that you'd really have to be lucky and keen-eyed to see anything of notice. Or maybe some night vision goggles. It got darker and darker. Eventually, I noticed, one after the other, little stars that started to appear. I turned off my phone and set it down so I could let my eyes adjust to the smaller ones. Just minutes and a few blinks later, the Milky Way showed itself, and it was gorgeous and huge. After a while, I started feeling very small and aware of myself. My mind slipped into retrospective thoughts and existentialism. Overthinking, I began to be mindful of my loud breath and started to breathe on command. But the breath I heard wasn't mine. I looked towards the house. The light was still on. Reese still should have been up there. I peered across the still pool water but didn't see anything towards the dark trees. I looked away from the house and more towards the direction behind me. The direction of the deeper woods. Just then, I thought I saw a quick flash of eyes reflect in the dark. My back muscles tightened, and my hair stood up. I instantly started sweating more than I had all day. I kept on staring into the nothingness, hoping that I didn't actually see anything, or that it would go away. But then I heard a twig or a branch snap, and I instantly remembered the existence of bears and cougars. I gripped the sides of my chair, my body and mind debating whether I should slowly peel away or make a mad, crazy dash to the door. A blast of air hit the side of my face, and I freaked. I tried to jump off the lounge chair, but I fell. My legs slipped through the space in the slots of the chair, and my ankle was caught in the folds. It felt ironic at the time because it felt like I was caught in the latches of a bear trap and was about to be eaten by a bear. But it wasn't a bear. When the thing came out of the darkness, it towered over me. I'd say it was almost nine feet tall and embodied the word darkness. Every inch of it was covered in jet black wispy hair. As it lumbered nearer, the hairs swayed like water. Its face was covered in the hair as well, but I could see its eyes, beady, black, and expressionless where I assumed its mouth was supposed to be dripped with saliva that landed by my feet. Though it stood on two legs, its arms were gangly and hung down to its ankles. I screamed. My arms pushed myself backwards in a clumsy manner. I sometimes slipped and I would slam my elbow into the concrete, but pain was not the first thing on my mind. I gained a little bit of distance from the creature. I could see it breathing heavily and fast. It pivoted towards me, and its knees bent, getting ready to pounce. I scrambled away faster, kicking my trapped legs, trying furiously to fling the heavy chair off. Instead, I managed to land my foot on the ground and gave a hard push. I propelled myself backwards enough to land on the edge of the pool, my tailbone hitting the corner before I splashed into the water. I sank and looked up in fear. I waited for it to follow me in. But through the surface, I saw its black silhouette against the starry sky and pushed away from the wall, swimming towards the center of the pool. With my clothes heavy and the chair still wrapped around my leg, I began to sink. I was running out of air. I pushed my arms harder against the pressure of the water. My chest hurt. It was cold. I felt my ears start ringing and my head wanted to explode. I kicked ferociously at the chair that entangled my leg. My shoe at that point had soaked with water and had become heavy enough to easily slide off. 
After that, it was easy to slip out of the plastic folds that had grasped me. With the chair gone, a dead weight was dropped from my body, and I finally was able to gain some momentum upwards. A final, exacerbated push from all four of my limbs let me breach the surface. I sputtered and gagged from the droplets that lined my throat. Violently retching and treading water, my body ached for the desire for a steady ground to puke on. Gulping the fresh night air, I slowed my thrashing. With the whitewash gone and my eyes cleared, I turned back to where I fell. To my dreaded horror, the demon figure was still there at the edge of the pool. Its paws, or hands, had clutched the corner of the water, leaning forward with freakish intent. Almost a statue, and made no noise, but I could see its chest pulsating quickly in the dark like a tired dog panting after a run. I expected it to growl or bark as I stared at it, but I still couldn't make out a mouth amongst its black fur-covered face. Not wanting to see its teeth, I turned and started paddling towards the opposite side of the pool. Very quickly, out of the corner of my eyes, I spotted movement in the shadows. Was it trying to meet me at the other side? Terrified. I turned my attention away from the edge to see legs. The creature moved so swiftly, running on all fours and taking giant, almost graceful strides. It was about to reach the edge of the pool closest to me. I immediately stopped paddling towards it. I braced myself for it to pounce on me and imagined suffocating in fur, water, and possibly sharp teeth piercing my skin. The creature did not slow down as it neared me. It charged, and with one hand grabbed the edge of the pool, and with the other it reached out and swiped me. I screamed. It did not come closer, but I couldn't help but to shut my eyes in fear. When I opened them, I saw a clawed hand, almost human except with longer fingers, reaching for me. It was desperate to grab my shirt or my skin and pull me closer to it. Yet, it did not want to jump in the water. A thought appeared. You can't swim, can you? I screamed. I don't know why I said that, but I wasn't thinking clearly. It didn't even react at all to me screaming at it. I thought I would try again, play it smarter this time. In the water, I took off my shirts and my other shoe. The clothes, except my undershorts, were no longer weighing me down. I slowly paddled to the edge of the pool opposite to the sliding door to the house. It moved cautiously along the edge of the pool, its beady eyes staring me down. I remembered my swimming lessons from elementary school. I forced myself to take big long breaths and try to slow my heartbeat down. I dove under the surface, down deeper in the pool's depth. My plan was to push off the wall and race the beast to the door. I remembered the latch was broken, but maybe I could delay it long enough to lock myself in the bathroom or one of the bedrooms. Then I would scream to Reese to call 911. Underwater, I readied both my feet against the wall and shifted my weight. Right as I was about to kick off, a long black hand appeared in front of my face. I couldn't help but to scream underwater. I snapped my mouth shut and ducked. With a quick hard force from my legs, I shot away from the wall, trying to gain as much distance as I could underwater. I had already lost so much air, and I was panicking again as I needed to resurface. When I did, I looked ahead and saw no creature. I swam like a mad fish, wishing at the time I had fins. I didn't bother to look behind me, but as my arms stroked the water ahead of my face, I peeked out of the side. Through strokes, I caught a glimpse of the mysterious being lumbering on the deck side. One of its arms, now wet and skinny, looked thinner and scraggly. I tried to swim faster, but my lungs could not keep up with the strenuous demand and I was losing speed. But I reached the edge. I pulled myself up and got one foot on the ground. But then it leaped. I thought it would lose speed at the sharp corner. I thought it might slip. Instead, its long black legs stamped down on the inner side of the pool's edge. Its nails clawed the cement and gained leverage. And in response, I used my other foot to send myself backwards, back into the water. 
as I sank down once again, facing the creature. I saw no change in expression, no show of frustration, like it didn't have a hunting instinct, and it just wanted to kill me out of spite, territory dispute, or some other hidden purpose. I swam far away from the edge and resurfaced. I was more than exhausted at this point. I just wanted to lie down. And that gave me the brilliant idea to play dead. Maybe if the creature just wanted me dead and didn't want to eat me, it would be satisfied. I tried to slow my breathing down. It was hard enough after the mad dash to the door and lactic acid started building up badly in my forearms. And the sight of the horrific demon-like thing didn't help either. I thought about faking a drowning, but was too tired to pretend to thrash about in the water. So I just rolled over onto my back and relaxed. Looking at the sky helped me get my breathing back to normal enough pace where I was able to take deeper, bigger breaths. I bobbed and floated for about a minute. The water rolled over me, and I held my breath when my face was covered. I was doing the best dead man's floats that I could. The break I gave my arms helped them feel better. They swayed lifelessly in the water. Out of the reflection, I saw a shadow fly through the air. For a moment, I thought it was a bird. Out of nowhere, a rock hit the back of my head. My teeth knocked, and pain shot through my skull. I turned myself upright and looked around to see a pool chair flying in my direction. I raised my arm and protected my face from the chair. The object crashed into me with great force. My head went underwater unexpectedly, and I flailed about, getting it back up above the surface. My chest hurt from the exhaustion. The muscles stung in my arms and legs. I was taking big breaths now. I thought if I could force enough air in my lungs, it would help me float better. Once I inhaled, some more water droplets got caught in my throat, and I had a coughing fit. The fit only made it worse for me to keep my head above water. I swallowed and yelled, exasperating my voice. I noticed movements in my peripheral vision. It wasn't from the creature. Through glazed eyes, I saw its shadow. Just frozen there at the water's edge. This other shadow came from the house's top window. It was Reese. Reese! I screamed. My throat croaked out the sound like a prepubescent boy. Help! I continued to cry. I even attempted waving my arm for attention. But as I looked away, I saw the shadow duck away and disappear. I cried out his name a few more times until it just turned into crying. I sobbed as my slight glimmer of hope faded just as fast as it came. I continued to cry and swallow water. I could barely keep my mouth open. My body ached to swim to the edge, but my mind feared getting ripped apart or eaten by the creature. Then my leg cramped. The pain shot through my thigh like a metal pole had been rammed through the bone. I held on to it and started sinking. I was so tired. I just wanted to hold my leg for a little bit. But then I needed air, so my arms exerted the extra efforts to lift my body back up. Then my arms started cramping. Not as suddenly as my newly dead weight of a leg, but a slow burn of the muscles. I started sinking again, curling my body in the fetal position. I descended into the darker waters. My ears rang until they popped. A new pain entered my head. I thought for a second maybe I could kick the bottom with my good leg and shoot back up to the top. Why was that pool so deep anyway? Or maybe... It wasn't, and it just seemed like it at the time. I desperately needed air. When I got to the bottom, I kicked at the ground lazily. It barely got me up. I sank back down and kicked again. I needed air. Everything was moving in slow motion. The pain was stronger, but I cared less about it. I tried harder to push through the water, which was beginning to feel more like sludge. I grabbed my throat and squeezed. My lungs demanded air immediately. I just wanted the release of holding my breath. I struggled harder against gravity. The weight of it pulled me down harder the longer it went on. My mind rang out, and darkness invaded the sides of my vision. I think I had breathed in some water. 
The pain was going away. I started floating. I felt a little peaceful, like I wasn't going to care that I was going to drown. I saw a light. It shimmered and wavered like liquid. Then a dark spot appeared in the center until it grew. Then I saw nothing. It was actually two days later when I woke up in the hospital. I saw my sister and my cousin talking to each other while sitting in two chairs next to my bed. My sister's back was to me, and Reese was leaning in, speaking in a low tone voice. I stared at him for a long time before I coughed. Reese looked up. Oh, hey! He said as he caught my eyes. My sister turned to see me and gasped. You're awake, thank God. She got up and awkwardly hugged me while I was in bed. That's when I realized all my muscles hurt and I could barely move. I'm going to call mom and dad, she said as she grabbed her cell phone from her chair and left the hospital room. Reese just kept looking at me. I stared back. What happened? I asked. What do you mean? He said in a stern and cold voice. You went for a swim, he got cramps, then you drowned. I called out for you, the monster. What are you talking about? He cut me off while he glared hard at me. I saw you walking around in the pool and I called the cops. I don't know CPR, but I got you out of the water. I started stuttering my words, baffled and wondering if I was crazy. I clearly remember the sound and sight of that creature. If you saw me struggling, why didn't you come out earlier? My voice squeaked. I wanted to grab his shoulder and shake him, desperate for some confirmation that I hadn't hallucinated that fear. I could only lay accusingly on the hospital bed. Reese was silent. I could see the anger growing on his face, like he was holding something back. And I knew... You did see it, didn't you? And you were too scared to come down to help me. That's why, isn't it? Shut up. I saved you. Reese yelled. You just got a cramp and yelled, then drown, okay? I knew at that point that no one would believe me if I said anything. And Reese would have fought me the whole way. Because he needed me to shut up. And he really needed it to not be real. I shut up from that point on. News of me getting better reached the rest of the family that arrived at the condo. I missed the reunion as I recovered. Nothing out of the ordinary happened while everyone else had stayed there. Reese never talked to me again, except through our fathers. My dad said in particular that Reese had convinced my uncle to sell that house in the woods. It was already worth more than what he bought it for, and I'm not sure what Reese said to his dad to make him sell it right away, but he never went back to those woods again. Our next family reunion was booked at a resort by a popular beach full of people, but I never talked to Reese as he avoided me the entire time. So it was never brought up again, but I've never forgotten the fear. Not the fear of water, but the fear that makes you choose to drown yourself instead of facing whatever horror those woods produced at night. And now, we have reached the end. Welcome back to the wakeful world. Thank you for delving into the dark with me. If you enjoyed what you heard, please consider sharing this video potentially to someone who would appreciate a few hours of relaxation or deep sleep. See you soon. V.